Hello and welcome everybody today to our Space of Cologne. I hope you had a, a good evening yesterday during the dinner and uh, you're all fit, ready to go for the second day. Um, what we're going to do today is we'll um, switch the schedule a little bit. We start with um, a grid session and for one hour and then we'll have a coffee break for half an hour and have our third uh, or second keynote speaker um, right after the coffee break. Um, then, uh, when you fill the grid for the afternoon, because there will also be an afternoon grid session, please remember to put your uh, name and topic, and if you want, also your, your Twitter handle um, on there, so people know how to find you on Twitter. Um, it's also important for the, for the video guys, so you will have your name shown on the live stream in the lower third. And um, then uh, I would like to take the opportunity, Chris will be, Chris Welch from ISU will be the first speaker afterwards. So he's here from ISU, from, and if you would like to know anything about ISU, uh, then please approach him. He doesn't have a table or anything, but he'll, he'll, um, he's here to talk to you about it, and he will, have, uh, will answer any question that you, that you might have. Yeah, then uh, we have a lunch uh, around 12.30, Ish, and in the afternoon uh, we have then a third uh, keynote speaker, which uh, happens to be um, the boss of this building here for the moment. Um, astronaut, just not to mention. But uh, after that we will have a group photo together with him uh, over in the, the training hall. So um, for those of you who have to leave early, sorry, but maybe you can stay um, long enough and then we'll have a, like our poster and just a little souvenir. Yeah, so I think that's, did I forget anything? Uh, right now, you guys can see live Samantha Cristofrasti on the space station working on the experiment of Triple Lux in Biolab. So it's being actually coordinated from up here in the Eurocom console that you saw yesterday. Serena, the crew trainer, uh, is on console right now doing live ISS operations, and this feed is live. Yes, uh, you can also talk to Jim about this. He's uh, responsible for the rack that it's being um, controlled in, in Biolab. And the control room for, for Musk, where it's being controlled, is uh, next door, too. And enjoy the first day. Jump to your sessions. The grid board is at the back. Andrea? OK. Chris, I think now it's your turn. Okay, well, I wasn't expecting to be first up, but uh, at least it means after I've given my talk, I can relax. Let me just start the timer. Right, so I have 10 minutes <clears throat> to talk about Lunar Mission 1. So who's heard about Lunar Mission 1? Okay, about 40% of you, so that's good. So uh, yeah, yeah, Remco has heard a little bit about it. Um, so a lo new Lunar Mission for everyone. Let me see how I get the slides to go forward. Where do I point the uh, control? Is it on? Engage your glasses. Or do I do that old school thing again? Next slide, please. <laughs> ah, here we go. So what is Lunar Mission 1? An international robotic mission to the south pole of the moon. It's a scientific-led mission, but it's intended to be funded publicly, and that's, that's the key thing about it. Um, it's exploring a, a new approach to funding, uh, funding science missions. Uh, later on, it may do, uh, may do other things. Uh, there might be a kind of Lunar Mission 2, might even be a Lunar Mission 3 involving humans, but for the time being, Lunar Mission 1. Um, and the two parts to it is you go to the moon, you drill a deep hole for scientific purposes, you extract the core, you analyze them, and then you have a deep hole at the south pole of the moon where it's very cold, very stable, and into that you put a digital archive uh, and also some snips of DNA belonging to people who have paid for the privilege. Uh, and, and that's how, in principle, the, the mission is, is going to be funded. Next slide, please. I haven't had to say that in years. So it's, a, it's an independent uh, project. It's not connected with any governments, although it originated in the UK. Uh, the idea, but it's very much intended to be international, so you can consider this to be part of Lunar Missions 1 international outreach program. I think this is the, probably the, you know, the, one of the first presentations uh, about it outside, outside of the UK. Um, so, next slide. I have to remember, I only have 10 minutes. 
So the idea is, uh, here's a concept for the lander. This was developed by the Rutherford and Appleton Labs uh, in the UK. That's one of the government research labs. We do this. Uh, a lander conceptually like this will, will fly to the moon. It will have this drill, which will drill down somewhere between 20 to 100 meters, which is very, very deep uh, you know, in comparison to any other drilling we've done on any other body, uh, and, and extract the core. Um, next slide, please. So this is, oh, back up one. Yeah, science. So this is it, lunar geology, 20 to 100 meters deep. Oh, okay. Oh, right, okay, I have control, right. Okay, um, and also potentially do some uh, radio astronomy uh, because uh, the, uh, a lot of the time the Earth won't be, won't be visible there. The cores won't be brought back, okay? The mission doesn't include that, but if there's a follow-on mission, then the, a follow-on mission would pick up uh, part of the lunar cores uh, and, and bring them back to Earth as a sample return. This is a, a sort of a idea of the data archive, so you would have, using technology that's yet to be determined, uh, because you know, the mission's got to, a way to run, but you can see these yellow rods represent the archive pods, which would then be fed down the hole uh, and, and effectively buried there um, and be preserved for anywhere from 100 million to a billion years, uh, depending on what's happened. So it could quite easily, you know, outexist, uh, uh, outlast human civilization. Uh, and uh, again, the key point is the mission will only go forward if enough people around the world actually pay for this. Uh, uh, according to the market survey that Lunar Mission 1 conducted, there will be people who are, who are prepared to pay for this. Not so much for themselves. The interesting thing is it seems to be more of a gifting thing. It's the sort of thing you buy for someone else, you know, for your, for your beloved. You say, you know, sweetheart, you know, as it's Valentine's Day, you know, I've sent a lock of your hair and pictures of you to be buried in a deep, dark hole on the moon. <laughs> it's kind of romantic in a kind of space geek way. Um, the other thing is it's intended to have a big education aspect. Uh, the purpose for the money that's going to be raised um, is that it will not only pay for the mission, but it will pay for a vast amount of space education and outreach uh, as well. Um, uh, I can explain what the BBC doomsday model means. That sounds a bit apocalyptic. It, it isn't. It's a reference to, a, to when the French invaded Britain uh, you know, in, back in 1066. There was a thing called the Doomsday Book, which was a bit like a kind of national audit of everything that they'd, that they'd conquered. So it's a sort of record. Uh, and there, there was a sort of the, the, the BBC, our uh, national broadcasters, recapitulated this in digital form about 20 years ago and created this digital archive of the United Kingdom. And so the idea is that there would be a digital archive of the world, which would also be in there, uh, as well as all the personal information. Let me look at my clock halfway through. Right, so this is the, this is the, 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 the funding. Um, and they're expecting, you know, 50 to $500 a, as a typical price, depending on how much digital storage you want, uh, you know, how many locks of hair you want to send. Uh, so $1.5 billion for the space project and the, the public engagement. Uh, and according to the business people, of which I am not one, okay, the projected revenue would be billions. And as I've already said, all the surplus would go to a non-profit trust. There was a, a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, at the end of last year, uh, you, can see, uh, you can see the slide there, it raised £672,447 uh, from 7,297 backers. Uh, any Lunar Mission 1 backers in the room? Oh, that's not bad. Okay, that's good. Um, so congratulations, you are founder backers. Uh, if you've been following the Kickstarter forum, you'll know that this money is now being used to put in place the, uh, the, the, you know, the first website, the first community forums, because they want to get a lot of world, global community engagement in this. So we're, we're currently in the, uh, in the six-month uh, preparatory stay phase. You can see we've got a nice... Oh, laser pointer's not working, but if you can't read, that says Stephen Hawking, okay? Everyone's heard of Stephen Hawking, I take it. Lunar mission, they, they, when I got these slides from the UK, there were a whole bunch of other people being quoted. I thought, but if you're not British, you won't know who they were. But I thought, everybody will know who Stephen Hawking is. Is bringing space exploration to all of us, an exciting scientific endeavor. So uh, that's the thing. It's a science-led mission, um, but uh, funded by public donation, effectively. So here's the program. We're at the, uh, the top part at the moment, the sixth month preparation of the management team. 
Um, Remco probably knows more about that than I do. I don't know. Remco is very uh, heavily involved in the, in, the, in the social media and outreach. So uh, you know, if you want to know questions about some of the nitty gritty about that, Remco is your man. Um, uh, then we go into the three month uh, stage, uh, placing the main contracts. Lunar Mission 1 is not going to build the spacecraft themselves. They're going to place contracts with you know, existing uh, you know, space, space entities to do that. Uh, while setting up the, the other aspects. Uh, and then we go into the six-year main development period, ultimately go to the moon, operate there for six months, uh, and hopefully on success, when we can see it's going to be a success, then there'll be a, a second mission to, uh, to bring some of the samples back. These are some of the people uh, involved, the mission team, science team, education team. Uh, Predominantly at the moment, as I say, UK, but one of the reasons I'm here is, as I say, to, to, to spread the words uh, because it's essential if this project is going to go forward that it isn't seen as, as a British project, okay? The, the initial idea, okay, came out of Britain, but it's very much seen by the team as, as a global project and, and Lunar Mission 1 is you know, actively trying to bring a, a more international community. So if you're interested in being, uh, you know, involved or getting your organisations involved, uh, you know, see me afterwards and I'll put you in touch with the relevant people. Uh, my prime involvement is through the education aspect, uh, ISU's uh, part of the education team. Um, so, I think that's pretty much what we said. We're setting up the management consortium. Uh, there'll be an e-commerce platform. We've got to have these things these days. We're going to sell these digital, digital kind of uh, memory boxes on the moon, you've got a way to do that. The Lunar Missions Club is, is, is in the process of being formed. All of those who put their hands up just now as original founders will become part of the Lunar Missions Club. So go us. Well, I don't know if we'll have a secret pin or a t-shirt or, you know, so maybe a handshake. Uh, yeah. uh, and then more people will be, uh, will be brought on board. Um, so uh, that's it. Uh, oh, that's not bad. Did it with 50 seconds to spare. So uh, if you want to know more, go to the Lunar Mission 1 website, follow Lunar Mission 1 on, on Twitter. Um, and if you've got any questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chris. Um, I think we have time for one, two questions. So raise your arm and I'll get you the, uh, the mic. Anyone? I'm wondering why you picked the moon to put that digital archive on. I think it's pretty well known that long before the sun will swallow the earth, the moon is supposed to drift away from us. So I can just imagine some aliens finding the moon floating around somewhere with, you know, some civilization parts in it where nobody knows where it belongs to. Well, it, it's a it's a combination of of the two things. I mean, the 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 idea for Lunar Mission 1 came out of a conversation that the founder, David Iron, was having with uh, somebody who was then the, the leader of one of the scientific research councils in the United Kingdom about how could you fund future space science missions. And it, it was very much from that point of view. And where could we go? What sort of science could we do? And what, if you like, funding opportunities were they related? So from the science point of view, you know, this particular community wants to go to the moon and wants to drill deep down to do the science. The question then is, how do you fund that? And that's really the kind of genesis of it. Um, there may be other approaches. I mean, suppose one wanted to do a mission to Venus, you know, you, then one would then have to work out what could you, you know, how could you make that attractive to people putting you know, money into it? You know, could they put their name on a piece of paper and have it in a balloon floating in the... Uh, in Venus atmosphere or something. What, what, what will people be interested in? Now here, since the scientific aspect was to drill a deep hole to take core samples, the question then was, how could you use this deep, deep hole? Uh, and that, that's why this approach has been taken, but it's very specific for this particular science mission. Thank you. Uh, do you plan to open the shareholding structure for uh, ordinary venture capital funds Ooh, or uh, keep uh, Kickstarter uh, only? Uh, well, the Kickstarter bit is funding only the startup phase, the first six months. There's got to be lots more money. I'm not a finance guy. Okay, the, David Iron, the founder, I mean, he's a, he's a space finance guy, a public private uh, partnership. Uh, did stuff on, 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 on Galileo and Skynet. So if you had a question about that, I would just say, I'll get, I'll get your details, put you in touch with David, and he will be able to answer those questions. 
Um, I think we have to continue. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Thank Welcome you very much. And I think next up is uh, Ian. Okay. So I think I have to start now. So uh, my presentation is how to be an ISS flight controller without being a flight controller. So this sounds like it doesn't work, but as you know, most of you know that my profile picture on Twitter is like this. And uh, I get asked and asked, are you a flight controller? Are you a flight controller? No, I'm not. I'm not even work for ESA or DLR or any other space agency yet. Well, uh, so what's the story about? So most of you follow like a spacewalk, as you can see here, like this. Well, I do it like this. So uh, as you can see, you have a lot of data. You have uh, like NASA TV there. You have uh, uh, tracking with Russian telemetry. Everything is live, so this is live telemetry. Um, and there you have Space Station Live. So these are all the data that are publicly available. So none of the data I tweet about are, are secret data. They are all available on the web. And uh, yeah, you can, you can use them, you can uh, find out a lot of things that you don't find out if you just listen to NASA television, like, uh, well, how does it work? It doesn't work. So on the lower, lower left, you see all the environmental data. So temperature, you see, you see um, the pressure inside the airlock. And it's very interesting, if there's an, if, if there's an, an EVA going on, you, you actually see how the pressure is decreasing. And uh, I think it's very interesting. Does it work? Yeah, so it, uh, it doesn't matter. So uh, uh, on the lower left, then you see the uh, KU. Oh, yes. Oh. Doesn't work either. Doesn't work. Yeah, so anyway. Uh, on the left, the, um, there you can see a KU downlink capability. So you see how the how the antenna is back retracting, and you see okay now it's like two minutes. Then we have uh, KU coverage again. So KU does mean uh, we have video downlink. So if there's no downlink, you can see on this data how long it will take uh, when we have this data back. On the, on the upper left, maybe most of you were in the control center, you saw this timeline, and this is a public version of it. You can uh, select all the uh, astronaut and uh, you uh, can see what they are doing right now. Um, if it's uh, day or night outside the station, if you, you see if the, uh, the station is right now in contact with the ground. Uh, you see uh, if the uh, solar rays are rotating or not. Sometimes they don't because they do spacewalks or they do uh, attitude change because they do a reboost or something like this. Um, you see the different attitude modes. So this is, uh, I think, it's very interesting uh, when you see all these data because, uh, yeah. So this is another one I wanted to show you. This is uh, actually the ATV undocking. Um, on the lower right, you see uh, the point, is, there should be uh, like uh, a red triangle, and it's indicating there is a point where the ATV is undocking. So you again see uh, the Kines live stream. So for those guys that using uh, Gem IP, you need to have the YouTube unblogger because uh, unfortunately YouTube doesn't allow live streams on YouTube in Germany. I don't know why. Uh, 
Yeah, you have again NASA television, you have again the live telemetry downlink, you have uh, on the lower left you have uh, the uh, control moment gyros uh, and the, the arrow. This is very interesting because if you compare it with my next uh, slide, you will notice that the error is much less because you can see on the lower right, you can see the ice is right now in free drift because right in, b before they have to unduck or in the process of unducking, the ice is in, is in free drift. So you see two indications that is noting free drift. The one is the American, this is the uh, control moment gyros, and the other one is the Russian segment. Uh, this is also, in, uh, so they, they use thrusters for uh, for attitude control, but this is also in free drift, so they have both modes are in free drift. The uh, solar rays are, are not rotating, the solar alpha rotary joints are in shutdown mode. So uh, this is yeah, very, very interesting if you follow events like, for me it's interesting, maybe it's also for you interesting. So, so again we have space station life over there. And yeah, there's another one, this is uh, a day before. Um, this was very interesting because it was not shown live on another television. So I had I used the ISS live stream. The ISS live stream provides you with uh, the upper right uh, a view where you have the uh, here. So this is not shown live on the web. You can just uh, uh, view the upper right, upper left of these six uh, live streams uh, on the web. But you have also the space to ground communication. So if Andrea or all the other Eurocom flight controllers are like to talk with the ISS, you can listen to them if they speak to the station. So this is very, very interesting. So sometimes I hear Andrea talking on my PC. And uh, well, yeah, that's interesting because here now you have not uh, another television showing, but you have the timeline and uh, there was a very interesting event because there they shut down the hatches for ATV the final time. So there's again another t in, uh, space station live and there you can see Alexander is uh, shutting down the ATV hatch um, together with Samantha. So down, down you see again the, uh, the control moment gyros and as I mentioned uh, you see there's not that much of error degree because the ISS is an attitude control as you can see on the uh, lower right and the solar rays are rotating as you can see on the right. So it is calling now auto track. So what do we do with all this information? Of course I put them on Twitter. Uh, I, of course, yeah, there we go. I have again another television. This was uh, the Soyuz undocking uh, a few week, a few days ago, uh, when uh, Butch Wilmore, uh, Alexander Samakutyev, and Yelena Sovova came back from Earth, and I actually got help from a, a NASA flight controller because I asked them about attitude controls because I found out that. Normally, uh, they go in, in free drift with the U.S. control moment gyros, but this time they did it with uh, just the control moment gyros and didn't go went in free drift with the just with the Russian segment, and it was very unusual. I noticed that because I I, I see how they do it on the normal way, and I I, I wrote him and I, he. he gave me a very detailed answer, so it's very awesome that I have Twitter to interact with real flight controllers and I get awesome information from them and I can share it with you. Um, yeah, again, we have Space Station Live here, but I don't uh, need to mention this again. So here, this is a, a, a screenshot I took uh, on Wednesday. Again, we have live stream, uh, ISIS live stream over there. We have the Russian live telemetry over there. But this time we have the DLR ISIS timeline on the upper left. And why do we have this? So uh, this is also another source. It looks, looks a little bit more that, like the real timeline, but it has actually less information. Um, why do we have to do this? Because this is what the real... Uh, Website is showing, and that's the problem uh, uh, we have with all this live telemetry. There has to be a guy behind it that is 
updating when there is crew change. So they changed the crew because uh, uh, Terry Words is no commander and not not in, not a, in space in, in, uh, in uh, flight engineer anymore. And uh, the complete timeline is broken when nobody at NASA noted is noticed this so far. And this is this really sucks because uh, then we you have four weeks you have no data at all, and this is very annoying. Um, well, maybe uh, the flight controllers here know that a few years ago there were just four instead of these six uh, uh, downlinks. Um, but the but the website never noticed this change, and they still just showing four of them. And of course, uh, the data are not right, so nobody is really taking care of this data. The websites are available, but uh, nobody's really taking care of this. So, uh, well, it would be great if there, there's m more support of this kind of data because it helps me to get a lot of information. It helps uh, you to get this information too, and it's great. So there are other sources. They, this is Russian, so there you can find. This is the best website where you can find all information about uh, what events are going up. Uh, I don't know where they get the, this information, but it's this is the website where you get this information first. Um, there's another more awesome sources I like to show you. This is uh, the nasaspaceflight.com. There, there you can find a lot of awesome, awesome information, and you can find the uh, yeah the website of the Russian MCC where I got this telemetry data from and also undocking and landing data. So, here you come to the end of my presentation. So, here I am again. I'm not working for ESA right now, not for DLR or anything, but I hope I do one day in the future, because this is my big dream, to become one day a flight controller. And I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm now open for questions. Okay, we have time for one question, if there is one. Yes. Again, it's maybe not a question, but a compliment. Um, you are doing a more professional job than some of us are doing. You're extremely well organized. You get your information from amazing places that... Um, so I, I'm very impressed with what you're doing, and if I would be a boss or anything, I would certainly want you to be on my team. So keep up the great job. Thank you. Thanks, Ian. Okay, next is... Um, the next one is Wim. We can start with that one. Uh, so I'm going to talk to you a little about Space Camp. I've uh, been there next year, uh, last year, going again this year. Uh, so Space Camp is for, uh, well, you could say it's for kids. You know, you have, uh, if you ask a kid what you want to become when you grow up, there'll be some that say policeman, some say firefighter, and there'll be those cool kids that say, I'm going to be an astronaut. So for those, you have uh, Space Camp where... <laughs> You can train as an astronaut and, uh, yeah, just experience what it's be like uh, to be an astronaut. Uh, oh, go back. So uh, it's not just for little kids, you know. You have 40-year-old kids, 80-year-old kids. If you dream about you want to become an astronaut at some point in your life, well, uh, you can also go to space camp as long as you still have that little kid buried somewhere deep inside of you. Uh, so it's at the uh, US Space and Rocket Center. It's an awesome space museum, and you have lots of exhibits, and you have mock-up models of uh, space station, of uh, space shuttles. I know they're kind of going down now, but they also have the Orion capsule, and they're always uh, increasing what they're doing. Uh, one of the famous persons who has gone to uh, space camp is uh, Samantha Cristoforetti. She was 70 years old or something like that, and she went on an exchange program where she was uh, you know, studying, I don't know what she was doing, but she was already dreaming of becoming an astronaut. 
So she went, uh, she had the opportunity to go to space camp. And uh, yeah, we all know what became of her. And uh, there's a couple of famous people, like you have a whole wall of fame with uh, people that did not just come astronauts, but also uh, flight controllers. You had uh, famous rocket builders. Uh, there's a whole uh, bunch of things you can do. It's also a great team building uh, experience. So you get people from all over the world like me, you get thrown into a team with people you don't know or barely know. Uh, we were lucky, we were all space teams together, so we kind of met each other online or we kind of knew each other. But it's great to get to know and work together with people from all kinds of disciplines. Uh, most of these people are not science engineers uh, or something like that. And uh, they do that mostly through simulated space missions. So you get to experience uh, the real thing. Uh, the fun part, or one of the fun parts, and most of the adults sometimes skip it, is living in the habitat. So it kind of looks like a spaceship inside. So you have like the waste management, which is the space camp term for the toilet, by the way. And you have the, uh, so you have the cool rooms. You have like slanted walls, uh, curved and... Uh, uh, you have big corridors and you have like life support system. That's probably the air code that was hidden behind that. But, you know, it all kind of looks cool like, like you're on a spaceship. And, you know, that's just your bedroom. So you can choose to go to a hotel if that's your kind of thing. I mean, they won't make your beds for you in the habitat. You have to do all that yourself. But it's really cool to be there, not just for the little kids, but I think the big kids get to enjoy that too. Uh, so it's at the US Space and Rocket Center. You can see it's, uh, it's predominantly a museum. So you can walk outside, they have rockets, they have space shuttles. Uh, also inside, they have all the museum stuff like uh, spacesuits like that, and uh, you have a big Saturn V in its entire length that you can you can uh, investigate. They have uh, lunar landers, so we even a, a bigger and a better model than the one you see outside. Of course, they're not going to put a detailed one in the rain. Um, so you st you get all the positions, the ground as well as the space. So you have the, the yeah, before the mission starts, you get to choose a position. Like not everybody can fly the space shuttle. You have uh, you need the entire crew. So you have people on the ground who will do the mission control. And uh, here it's the Eurocom. There it's uh, the Capcom, uh, who speaks to the people on the shuttle, the, the ones that really fly. You have also the mission mission specialists. They just fly around. With the crew, then you have people, if it's a mission to the International Space Station, you have the scientists there who are doing their science stuff. And if you go to the moon, it's the same. You have people on the moon uh, that do their things. So, like I said, the ground crew, also uh, on the lunar base, you do experiments. You also have EVAs. So you get to put on the, the big bulky spacesuits with, uh, with the gloves and all the trouble that comes with it. They will host you into the air, so you're kind of dangling there. Uh, you need to speak to the guy on the ground if you want to go up or down. And you have to de disassemble things and try to put them back together, if you're lucky. Um, so on the spacecraft, you have pilots, commander, mission specialists, science. So you have the space shuttle, you have the Orion spacecraft, and they do several missions, they have short missions, they have long missions. Um, so uh, it starts with the training, so you have like the timeline that you have for the ISIS now, you also get your own timeline, you get all your manuals, all the stuff you got to do. Mostly it's uh, flipping switches, you know, uh, they, they, they kind of play it real, so if the ISS is flying and it's going in the dark, then you get to turn off the solar panels, turn on the battery, or that kind of stuff. So it's really in immersive. So I have like all these buttons. They all work. They're not just there for, for fun. So you have to do it in the right order. If you do it wrong, then the, the, they have some kind of, they call them the space ghosts, the people who operate the thing. And they, they just sit there, and uh, they'll tell you whether you've done it right or wrong. And sometimes you have to do it over again. Also, you have to be very careful. If you are on the ISS, then stuff floats away. So if you have your book, your manual, and you leave it there on the desk, then uh, the space goes will come past, and suddenly the book won't be there anymore, and you have to go looking for it because stuff disappears in space. So I also have computers where you have to enter numbers or check numbers. Or, uh, like everything's there, and you can see some kind of buttons, but it's really a lot of buttons. And uh, you can't memorize all of them, so you have to look in your book, and it says, oh, it's panel left seven or left aft seven that's in, in the back, and you have to go look for the panel and look for the button. And uh, it can get stressy because the time lapse keeps continuing. I mean, the ship's not going to stop because you didn't push the button on time. Um, 
Okay, so uh, that's when everything goes right, but in long emissions, stuff can also go wrong. So warning lines will pop up where, you know, it's not long and nominal. You have to look in the book what the warning is, and you can have severe warnings, and you can have little warnings, and sometimes you have to drop everything you're doing and address an even more severe warning than the one you already have. Um, so yeah, you have the warning lights, you have uh, values you have to monitor, like if you are the EECOM and you have to look whether there's enough, enough oxygen on the ship. And, you, know, you have to do the calculations because uh, every once in a while they have to switch out a, a canister with uh, fresh oxygen or for the CO2 scrubber you have to replace something. Um, and it might be that you try to contact mission control and nobody's saying anything because they just had a tornado warning. So everybody run to the shelter. It's virtual, of course. And um, yeah, in, uh, if I have, like, like for me, they, they asked me to, uh, to stand up in the middle of a flight and then, uh, you know, you're experiencing 3G and then you're supposed to hit your head and uh, you need a nurse. So there's medical emergencies, uh, crew would fall out. And if everything fails, uh, you know, then uh, you fly your shuttle into the ISS, it falls out of the sky, it lands right on mission control, and then uh, you have a bunch of dead people. But, uh, <laughs> it can also happen. Uh, so there's other activities. You have scuba diving, you can explore the museum, you have guided tours, you have a ropes course, you have a quiz night, IMAX movie, and an astronaut might pop up and give a speech, and you can meet him and have your picture taken. Uh, so other activities, uh, like in the real mission, we design our own patch. Uh, so we do the zip line thing. You build a rocket, you get to launch the rocket. So uh, all that kind of stuff in there. They have astronaut training simulators, which you can do like lunar gravity walking, and uh, you can do the spinning thing, and also the, the chair, like in the, in the movie Gravity. You can also fly around in that. Uh, if you're a U.S. citizen, you can visit the NASA Marshall Space Center. It's right outdoor. I haven't been there, so I had to, luckily I had all my teammates uh, making, taking the pictures for me. Um, and then you have also Aviation Challenge. So if you're not so much into space, but you're into flying, then you can uh, fly the movie Top Gun. Uh, it's basically the same concept. You can sit on the plane and you can... Uh, yeah, also push the buttons and shoot other planes, and uh, it's cool for people that like uh, flying. So uh, that's Space Camp, and if you want to go, you just go to www.spacecamp.com, and uh, it's kind of expensive, but you get a whole lot of stuff, and it's really cool. Thank you. Yep. Any questions from the audience? Um, in Germany, there was just a movie on the television that was basically shot in, in, uh, um, in this camp. So it's really great to see these, uh, these images that you are showing because I recognize some of the scenes of the movie. So, uh, yeah, it's a good motivator to go there. My kids love the movie, so now I know that I should take them there and that they can enjoy it themselves. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, then uh, thank you, Wim. And uh, I think next up is Audrey on the Rexus Bexus program. Working. Okay, so hi, everyone. Uh, today I wanted to share my experience within the Rexus Bexus program that I was involved with uh, last year. So what is, what is Rexis Bexis? So Rexis stands for Rocket Experiment for University Students. And Bexis, I will let you guess it, stands for Balloon Experiment for University Students. So basically, it's a partnership between SNSB, the Swedish National Space Board, DLR, the German agency, and ESA, that allows university students, European and university students, to launch an atmospheric or uh, microgravity experience into a board, a sounding rocket, or a balloon. So basically, there are usually two rocket launches and two balloon campaigns per year. So it can send up to 20 experiments, student experiments. So I was involved, I, I mean, my experiment flew on uh, Rexus 15, so it was launched in uh, last May from Ace Ranch. So I'm going basically to give you more of a point of view from the Rexus side of Rexus Bexus. So here's our rocket. This is actually rocket Rexus 15. 
the length is of a rocket is 5.6 meters. Its diameter is uh, 35.6 centimeters. Aboard, you can have up to five ex student experiments and a fifth one in the nose cone. The, huge, the maximum apogee of this rocket is 90 kilometers, so we were quite heavy, so I think we only went to 80 kilometers. We seen the orange rectangle, it's actually the experiment uh, my team designed, which is called Isaac. So I don't really have time to get into details about Isaac, but very basically we had uh, two free-falling units, FFUs, that we had to eject within the mesosphere, so around 60, 70 kilometers. And so one of the FFU was going to be was spinning. So actually the rocket is spinning. So when you launch your FFU, when you eject your FFU, they are also spinning. So you are spinning, so it helps stabilizing. And we had to do spectroscopy between the two FFUs. So one of them was the emitter, so it had LEDs all around, it was spinning. And the other one was the receiver, so it had like um, a half part, half of the FFU was spun. So it had a motor that <laughs> was going to be uh, trigger after the ejection to to yeah to to have like an immobile uh, part and it had like so a tracking algorithm to find the other FFU in the sky point at it and get the signal from the LEDs and perform some spectroscopy. So yeah, that was actually the, the main first goal. Well, unfortunately, we didn't really uh, had time to finish this in one year. But another experience, another team from my university which is, by the way, the KTS University from Stockholm, is going to fly the same experience and we hope finish it for the next launch next year. So that's basically the aim. that was basically the aim of my experience. So what's so awesome, awesome about this program and why you so joined? So first of all, this is a real, if this is your real first own space project. So we, you really get a chance to make your own design. So I was in charge of the ejection system. So that's what you can see here on the screen. So on the left, it's what we presented at the selection workshop in November 2012. So as you can see, it's a bit like, <laughs> so you can see the two FFUs on top of each other, and there's uh, this orange part that's going to push away the blue part. A lot of magic happens, so it's going to be ejected. A few months after, we presented this uh, really more developed design that you can see in the middle at the um, critical design review. So this is a bit more precise. You can see the pyro cutter on the top. And after a few months of manufacturing and final design, we came up with this um, on the right picture of this final experiment. So actually, you cannot see the FFUs here, but you see, well, you can still see the uh, pyro cutter. The, um, actually, you can see the hatch. The hatch were quite big, actually. So it's 80 centimeter wide. Uh, I don't mean, height and uh, 240 centimeters of white. So actually, ESA experts were quite um, <laughs> unsure about uh, the stiffness of our module and quite a bit afraid of what would happen at the launch. But we had to do some FEM modulation and prove that it would survive the launch. And it did, hopefully. No. <laughs> so yeah, great. This program is a great opportunity to connect with uh, space experts from several agencies. So you have um, concrete feedback from um, experts from ISA, DLR, SNSB, also ZARM, so the people from the drop tower in Bremen. Actually, on the top picture on the right, this is the vibration, um, vibration test setup. So we have our RMU, rocket mounted unit, on it. This is also the opportunity for you, for all the students, to develop new skills, like Usually when you, when you study, you, you maybe not have the opportunity to have a concrete experience to do your own stuff. So for me, it was, for example, the first time that I could actually manufacture my own parts, so it was a really great experience. And, well, that's already a lot of reason to join this program, I hope. And actually, my favorite part was all the traveling around. So our best camp was actually in uh, Stockholm. In Sweden, we were all master students from the KTH University. Uh, for the selection workshop, we traveled to ESTEC in Nordvik. Then for the, critical, the, the preliminary design review and the critical design review, we traveled to Hobenfaffenhofen in uh, Germany. And uh, finally, for the integration week, we went to the drop tower in uh, Bremen. So that's actually uh, one of my 
few of my team members and me on top of the drop tower in Bremen. We actually have a very nice bar on the top of it. I don't usually say it. Until it was, um, well, the most exciting moment of this project was, of course, the launch campaign, which uh, is uh, in Kiruna, so it's uh, somewhere in um, somewhere in Swedish Lapland when you don't risk hitting anyone with a sonic rocket. So it's basically nothing around the Australian Space Center. And this is actually Paxi from ESA waiting for the launch. So actually, I have the, I have the launch video because we had a GoPro on the rocket. So you're going to be able to see this. Actually, it's more like a six, a strong six. <laughs> so this is, this is a view from the rocket, you're on the rocket. So we showed this after the launch party. We had a huge party after the launch. And we showed this the day before. Everybody was hangover. It was a really bad idea. But, but for you, I cut it a bit. <laughs> So look at the bottom corner on the right, you're going to see the ejection of the FFU. Yeah, and here it goes. Quite a few students working on this experiment. Yeah. <laughs> a very international team, actually. There was no Swedish students when we went on the to the selection workshop. Voilà. So now it's your turn. I mean. If you want to join, you can, either if you're a teacher, you can uh, build up a team of students and um, send your proposal either to ESA or to DLR. And if you're, of course, students, you're also welcome to join this program. If you want to know more, uh, well, go on rexbexes.net. Thank you. Thank you, Audrey. Um, any questions from the audience? Thanks, Audrey. I, I think it's really always impressive to see how, how students put so much dedication into their own projects and how really this, this fascination for doing something in space um, generates ideas well beyond what, what we thought before. Um, I was just wondering, when, when looking at your experiment, did you actually look at, did you recover also the ejected units from the rocket? Well, in this case, uh, unfortunately, we could not launch the real FFU, so we launched dummy FFU, so there was no point in uh, going together. But of course, um, so East French provides you uh, two helicopters, one that is going to get the main payload, which is the rocket, and one that is in charge of recovering the FFUs. So usually you have uh, a GPS uh, or a beacon in your FFU and you can find it, if you're lucky. <laughs> well, I know that also, um, actually, and maybe that is uh, an idea for you as well. I, I know from uh, earlier teams that participated to the Rexus program, actually, that went back to Kiruna in summer and, and yes, just did some yes. hiking around it's a case of, the field to see yeah. if they can find some stuff. I think one of the experiments, they, they finally they found their payload like 10 years after the launch. Out of like, because this is super big, I mean, and it's all swamps and 
Yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Louise. With the experience that you had doing this project, what would you do differently if you were to do it again? Um, I think we spent too much time maybe on the design part. It's uh, sometimes it's really tough to like say stop, then we stop and we just start manufacturing and doing it. It's a bit scary, you know, like uh, you're like, okay, now we stop and we really do start doing something concrete. So, but you have to do it at some point. All right, thank you. Somebody else with a question? Um, you showed in the video that you had a big international team. Yeah. Was that the team for your project alone? And can you describe how you were working together? If you're international, what, you know, you cannot be physically together. Can you give a bit oh, more information? Uh, actually, there? yeah. So we were a bit, we were okay, we were international, but most of all the students were actually uh, part of a master program in uh, KTH. So we're all physically at the same place. It's true that sometimes it was a bit hard, like for summer when everybody went to their home, uh, home uh, country. That was a bit tough, but we managed like through Skype or uh, like remotely to work remotely together. And actually the core team was like uh, five people in the beginning and all the names you saw is uh, like, for example, a bachelor students that joined us for one semester and so on. Uh. All right, thank you. Um, I think we can wrap this up now. Um, <laughs> We are a bit tight on schedule. Um, there is a coffee break now. First of all, thanks to all the guys who presented Thank here. You. And uh, I think we now have a coffee break and meet back here in the foyer at 10.45 for the keynote um, speech. Yeah. And uh, yeah, enjoy the coffee break. Sure. Right, guys. Shall we start? You're still, everybody is still. <laughs> we know that the conversations are very much fun and which you can continue later. Please take your seat. Thank you. So today we got another uh, nice greeting tweet from an astronaut. He is not just as high up as Samantha is, but at least he's in Italian mountain skiing somewhere, so he's kind of higher than we are. So it's not space, so thanks, Christopher, for this. Uh, we're certainly having fun, and uh, maybe at the next event you can join us again. Absolutely. And uh, so for, for our next uh, guest speaker, I am very pleased to welcome uh, onto the stage uh, Jürgen Hill, he works uh, at the head of, um, he works at DLR headquarters in Bonn, quite close by, uh, and he is actually, has a lot of roles, I'm officially at work, he is in charge of uh, exploration at DLR for, uh, for space, um, and in, in ESA affairs as well. So uh, this guy is also on the international um, committee, uh, which sets the roadmap of what we're going to do in future space exploration, and in his uh, spare time, he does a lot of different activities like Yuri's Night. I uh, was quite involved in the space station design workshop. We've got information on all of those. And, uh, and if you're lucky, I would um, possibly ask him to see some awesome space pictures of his own that he has. But he'll tell you more. Jürgen, thank you. I don't know if I really have so many of uh, my private pictures on on the show, but uh, I've put together a lot, some stuff, different topics basically. Um, as Andrea mentioned, I'm on not only have my professional space hat on, but to some extent I'm also a private space nerd. Um, and I really want to go a little bit around space exploration, at some point giving you a little bit of an overview, what could be future events, what, could, what is happening right now in, in DLR, in Germany as a whole, but also some ideas of how can we use space exploration to inspire. And um, let's start with a, with a very easy question first. So when we look at the last year, 2014, what were the, the main space events that were resonating in German media? Maybe, maybe we have some guesses from the audiences. I thought it was a pretty um, easy guess, actually. So we have Rosetta one, is there Blue Dot? Okay, too easy, actually. So I, I think number one is probably Blue Dot. Alexander Gerst, with his mission on the, on the ISS, really 
had a media appearance in Germany that was crazy. And the question is, why is that? It's because this is the human element of exploration. This is really what, what people feel. Um, they, they, people dream about going to space. People want to understand how it is to live and work outside of space, uh, outside of, of Earth, um, to change this perspective of looking back at our planet. And it's really impressive. And I think this is something that, that inspires people, people like you, to, to be interested in space and to work in space. The second one, obviously, uh, Rosetta, the landing of Philae on the comet, also something that was received well beyond the professional um, expertise uh, of space. And that is because this is really the true essence of why we go into space. This is breaking frontiers, going to places where we haven't been before. This is the first landing ever on a comet. This is really trying to find out um, where does our solar system come from, where does Earth come from, where does life come from, in the end, where do we come from? And also we were trying to understand what our future could be. And I think this is really the, the, the major essence of why we go into space, at least for me. Um, I don't know if anyone else uh, knows other things like um, how many launches have there been in total in the last year? Any guesses? 92. Um, mostly, only a few of those really keep sticking in your head. And this is the events that you can relate to. And I think having the human element and having this exploration element, new frontiers, is um, the biggest push for people to get involved into space. So let's look at what could be the future of uh, human space exploration. And for that, I want to drift up a little bit into the international agency world. Um, I don't know if that has been talked about already yesterday, but there is a group of uh, space agencies called ISEC, the International Space Exploration Coordination Group, that has been formed for about six years now, and where different agency experts talk about what a common way forward could be for space exploration. This is really planning on what, are, what technologies, what capabilities do we have? How do we have to extend those to get further into space? DLR is one part of that, also ESA. Um, but in total, 14 space agencies around the world. I've also put the website there, have a look um, at the products. And one of the most prominent products is that we've talked about something that we call the Global Exploration Roadmap. And this Global Exploration Roadmap is supposed to sketch basically a, a, a picture of the future of the next 20 years of what could be elements um, of human space exploration. And I've put um, a, a general overview of that roadmap here that is starting from the International Space Station where we have already developed a partnership between different space agencies. Five space agencies are currently involved in the ISS if you look at the, the actual ISS partnership, but it's actually more when you look at um, the, the nationals, uh, the, the countries in, in Europe that are part of the European Space Agency as a partner. And we, we should build on this partnership. We should build on the capabilities, the systems, the vehicles that we have and what we learn on ISS. On the other hand, we have a lot of robotic missions that go out there to discover and to prepare future missions. And we have grouped them here, a major, uh, mainly in, in three areas that are related to the destinations where humans might, in the near future, go live and work. And that is the moon, that is near-Earth asteroids, and that is Mars. Those are the destinations that we really look at for, for people to go in the next, let's say, 10 to 20 years. Um, there's a number of these missions already being planned all around the world in all the different space agencies. And what we try to do is make sure that not everyone does the same thing again, so that we have complementary instrumentation, that we have complementary capabilities, robotics, that we use, that we go to different destinations, to, do, to different landing sites, for example, and coordinate how these missions can work together and how the, the actual scientific findings that we get have the best meaning as a whole. When we then look at the human element, we want to prepare um, our horizon goal, the human mission to Mars. And this human mission to Mars needs a lot of um, advancement in capabilities and technologies, and for those we need to do some intermediate steps. And these intermediate steps are um, currently grouped in three major themes that we want to look at. The first one is understand how you can live longer and without um, 
and with closed loop systems with, with, without um, resupply from Earth for a long time in space. So that is extended duration crew missions. And those are most likely to happen in the Earth's moon space first, maybe then for, for longer trips. We're looking at how could a system, a deep space habitat in an Earth's moon um, libration point or potentially in a lunar orbit work to, so that we learn how to live outside of Earth for missions of years and longer. The other one is to look at exploring near Earth asteroids where we can find resources, where we can um, do external operations of robots and crew. And this is uh, mainly driven by the, by the American approach, by the American initiative to, have, uh, to bring an asteroid back into a distant retrograde orbit around the moon. And the third one then is actually using the moon, humans to the lunar surface. These three themes are the ones that, that we use to prepare the capabilities to go longer into space, to work with resources, and to work on planetary surfaces. And once we master all those three, that's when we're ready to go to Mars. Whoops, that was too fast. And in order to prepare that, we have identified a number of activities, preparatory activities, that we want to focus on now. Because we also have to acknowledge that we cannot go tomorrow to the moon easily because we need to develop the systems. Um, but what we can start tomorrow is develop the technologies and, and capabilities that we need to do that. And for that, we're looking at using the ISS for the best possible extent for exploration preparation. For that, we, we are looking at the robotic missions that we have already planned and how they can help us to find out what we need to find out in order to go to, to Mars and to other destinations. We use analog simulations on Earth. How do we, we go to destinations that look like Mars or that, that represent a certain amount of um, environmental aspects of the destinations where we want to go in order to test our systems? We are starting to develop new space systems and infrastructure together. Um, we are looking at advanced technologies, and that dropped off there. It's supposed to be advanced technologies um, that we need, like robotics, um, like more automation, closed loop systems. Um, and we look at the health and performance risks for the humans. How do humans actually live and work in space? And what I've done is now, when we look at how is that space exploration being made in Germany, um, what does Germany currently concentrate on in these fields? Where do, we, where do we work and how does that fit into the international picture? And that's what I want to tell you in the next couple of slides. First one is obviously exploiting the ISS and there. It's not Germany as um, the sole country, but obviously Germany as the largest supporter of the ISS program in Europe. And working closely with ESA, with this facility mostly, we are looking at um, really using ISS to the most extent possible, both scientific ways, but also in ways of preparing the future. And you, we've already talked about the mission of Alexander Gerst, the highlight also <laughs> of the Football World Cup. There's a number of other activities that we do in using ISS that play into these areas of um, looking at uh, new technologies, tailor robotics from ISS. I think Metron was also something that probably someone spoke about already where we command robots from the International Space Station to understand how robots and humans can work together when we go to the moon or to Mars. And we are working together with NASA on developing the European service module um, for the new crew vehicle, Orion, of NASA. And that is a, a huge step because on the one hand, NASA has taken the, or has accepted Europe as an equal partner in order to develop that system that is critical for them because they cannot fly their mission without this system that comes from Europe. And at the same time, um, it gives us an opportunity to be part of human space exploration beyond Earth orbit that we could have never afforded on our own. Um, then when we look at robotic missions, there's a number of stuff where uh, Germany and DLR is, is involved. We've already talked about Rosetta as the biggest event. There is a, a lander package actually on a Japanese mission, Hayabusa 2, that launched um, in, uh, in December last year and is on its way to an asteroid and that, that small package there is about um, 10 kilograms and will go down to the surface to in situ investigations on the surface of an asteroid. We have systems, instruments 
on nearly all missions, international missions that go to other, to other planets. In this case, Mars, there is um, an instrument on the Curiosity rover uh, that is partially built in Germany. There's an instrument on the next US mission to Mars in 2016, the InSight mission, where we will start drilling into the, sur uh, into the surface of Mars. There's um, instruments on the ESA ExoMars missions where we are strongly involved in developing the, the system, in developing instruments that can find life, that can find organic materials um, on Mars. And then when we go into the technology side, we have two really strong pillars that we try to build around when we look at the German space program. So the one theme is habitation and life sciences. So we want to really understand how we can live and work in space. What does that entail for the humans and for the systems that we need? So there's research facilities like EnviHub right, right next door, where we look at how humans um, change uh, when they're in, in microgravity for a long time. We look at life support systems um, and, and linkage of life support and energy systems in parabolic flights, in, in flights like the Bion capsule where we send um, a biological closed system into space for several months to look at how does that regenerate in space, how long, uh, how does the exchange of, of fluids work. We participate to analog missions and we're currently building a satellite that is called Icropis, where actually we will try to grow plants in gravity like uh, on the moon and on Mars. So that satellite will be spinning and will be simulating different gravities um, and we'll try to find out how we can then use that for closed loop life support systems in the future. This all being first technology steps, the question obviously is what could be the German and European role when we look at the larger picture, when we actually go further out into space. And there we have done a number of studies already to look at what could future habitat systems look like, what could European roles be in those habitat systems, and that is what we're discussing right now with international partners to understand um, how we can advance those ideas. And on a similar scale, we're working when, we, when it comes to automation and robotics. Here, there is a number of activities going on to develop robots in terms of mobile uh, systems for planetary surfaces, rovers, crawling things that can go up and down um, very steep terrain. We're looking at testing those live in the field, but we're also looking at um, technologies for orbital servicing, technologies that help us to repair stuff in space. And we're looking at how to live off the land, like the in situ resource utilization element of it. How can we extract, for example, oxygen out of uh, the lunar surface? And with all these activities, what we're currently um, aiming at is basically getting uh, a, a German robotic element uh, towards the moon in the near future. Now, all these activities going on, I, I often have the feeling that the, the work that agencies is do, are doing is, could be better connected to the younger generations, to the public, and I'm really impressed of what I've seen today already in the morning of how engaged all of you are um, in finding the information that you need. Sometimes you have even more than some of us in the agencies have. Um, so I think we can really start working a lot on inspiring people to work together to find new ways of doing things. And there's a number of elements uh, of activities that I've been involved in. Um, and two opportunities I want to talk about in my, in my last couple of minutes. One of them um, that Andrea already mentioned is a so-called space station design workshop. This enthusiasm of and this interest in going beyond Earth orbit, going with humans into space, is something that we can use to generate new ideas. There is a workshop um, that is, has regularly already happened at the University of Stuttgart, but supported strongly by ESA, also by DLR, where students come together and design their own space station. And this space station design workshop is happening again um, this July, 26th to 31st. Um, the application is still open, so for, for students or young professionals that want to participate, check it out on the website. It is really an intensive one-week challenge where basically we put 30 students um, in two rooms because actually we, will, we have to ask, the, the, we ask them to work competitively for the prize. 
And from the scratch, from a mission statement, until the end, they design their human mission and present it um, in order to, to uh, convince a jury of the feasibility of their approach. And this is um, sometimes much more impressive to see the ways, the new ways of thinking of uh, younger generations um, when addressing specific problems that sometimes the professionals at the agencies have problems to, to cope with. The other activity is how do we go out even more to the general public? And that is, we want to find ways to show that the stuff that we do in space is really cool. And I think all of us are convinced about that. And one um, activity uh, that, that really does that is Yuri's Night. Yuri's Night every year goes out um, around that date of the 12th of April, around uh, the, the flight of Yuri Gagarin, um, to bring a world space party out, to bring music, to bring um, arts together, to bring young generations together to, to talk about space simply in very different formats. Where it comes from is, is really that date in space history that changed everything. That is um, the 12th of April, 1961, Yuri Gagarin, the first flight into space. And luckily enough, the 12th of April has um, also a meaning um, on the US side as the second larger um, space actor, that is on the 12th of April 1981, exactly 20 years later, was the first flight of the US space shuttle. So we already have one date that brings together two, the two largest actors in space. And that's what uh, a number of young people thought was, was really impressive and then decided another 20 years later, on the 12th of April 2001, to start the first Yuri's Night. And it's ha it has happened every year since then in ever larger formats. Um, as an example, this was 2013, there were 354 events all over the world, 57 countries, 7 continents, even the Antarctica station participated in that, and, if this works, even the International Space Station participated in that. That is a picture of the, the mission of Nespoli in 2011, the, actually the, the year of 50 years, um, the 50th celebration of Yuri Gagarin's flight, and they all celebrated Yuri's Night on the International Space Station. It is largely um, also reflected in media. Uh, there is, um, every, every year in April, you see a lot of articles and events popping up um, all over the world that are connected to space, to Yuri Gagarin, to humans living in space, to exploration. Um, and this is just a snapshot of the different, um, to, to get a feeling of the different aspects that are typically connected to these events. When we look at Germany this year, 2015, there is already, at least to my knowledge, five act, um, activities being planned um, in Bremen, here in Cologne, in Chemnitz, Munich, and Stuttgart, which is also the reason why I'm bringing this up um, here, and you have seen uh, all around, probably, or hopefully, already, these kind of flyers. Um, and I invite you all to come to that event. On the 12th of April, we will bring actually space now to the city center of Cologne um, to get also a larger audience to show them that, that this stuff that is being done in space is really cool. And we will hopefully get um, a live greeting from Samantha from the space station. We will have uh, astronauts there and um, a lot of other just informal chat about space and how cool it is to look into our future in space. And now that um, Andrea also mentioned that part, I also mentioned I'm, uh, I'm a, a little bit of a space geek. I said I don't have uh, personal pictures in here, but I'm not true, not, not fully true, because to, to show you really how much of a nerd I am, this picture is one of my wedding pictures. <laughs> and with that, I think we can just take a few moments to, to lean back and um, recapitulate what has happened already in more than 50 years of human space exploration. And uh, with the words of, of Yuri Gagarin, Hayekhali, let's have a look um, if it works.
nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. That was a video being done for the, that was generated in 2011 at the 50th um, celebration of Jürgen Garin's flight. Every time I watch it, I have the hairs on my back stand up. So really, um, I hope that this is an inspiration for all of us to say that we need to continue exp to explore and to bring space, uh, to make space a reality. Thank you, and I'm open for questions. So my question is, why 
does this exploration roadmap not include any private company, private efforts? Because um, let's be honest, SpaceX will come in and do all the Mars stuff in half the time for a fraction of the price. So. Well, first of all, we don't know, and that's, that's the major reason, because we don't know. Um, at the moment, this is something that is being discussed between the agencies, and um, we acknowledge that there is a lot of activity on the private sector, and if you look at the roadmap, um, not in the representation that I showed here, but there's a different representation that gives more detail about the, the actual missions, and there, it says often in this roadmap, opportunities for private sector engagement. But we really feel that as an agency, it's not our role to tell them what to do. But really, it's the role of the private sector to tell us what they could do. And then we have to find a way to make both of them work together. But it's, um, this is an agency element at the moment, but we are totally aware of what's happening. Next question. Hello. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I was just wondering, the, the British government has just uh, started talking about a spaceport, and I was wondering where you thought the European Space Agency should be investing its launch ca capabilities. So, sorry, I didn't catch all of that. Can you...? Um, the, you, you yeah. Did you get the bit about the British government? Yeah. Yeah. Where do you think that the European Space Agency should be investing in its launch capabilities? That's a good question. I was hoping that um, actually most of the investment in the launch sector could at some stage be done on the private sector <laughs> rather than being done on an institutional one. That is my personal feeling of it on the one hand. Um, but obviously, uh, I believe that really we have to find a way to bring the institutional space sector into this element of exploring, this element of going further than what others can do and would do in terms of risk, in terms of capabilities, in terms of technologies. So there's a lot of um, space activities that we should be ready to give to the private sector. But there is also a number of activities, and that is mostly when it comes to human space flight, when it comes to human space exploration, to, to, get, to go this step further than what ha someone has done before, where, where governments can take a major role, and that typically involves larger launch capabilities. Time for a couple more questions. Uh, the mic's coming to you from the left. Hi. Um, it's going to be maybe a little bit of a nasty question, um, but it's also to try to make you aware of something that I think is a very real thing happening. Uh, timing is everything. And of course, the ground segment of ISS, the people inside it, are really anxious to know what's going to happen in the future because day by day we see people moving out and going into Galileo. This human aspect, is this being considered by politicians on your level that you must act early enough to give a sign to the people that you don't get a chaos uh, situation, that you get a lot of people with expertise leaving into new fields? So I just wanted to, it's a question, but also kind of a, uh, yeah, <laughs> a panic call uh, almost, yeah. to make you aware that people plan ahead years in advance, and I just want to know whether the political world and the, yeah, those kind of dynamics are, are understood and taken into consideration. And, and I don't think there's a simple yes or no answer to that. Um, and, and I think many of the people are aware in the, in the working elements of the agencies anyway, because we work with the people all the time, but um, it is something that we're struggling with from time to time to bring it into the the, the consciousness, especially of the political decision-making level, to think about this long-term element of developing capabilities, of developing workforce. Um, and it's something that, that, yeah, that we work on every day, but uh, it's not something that we can simply solve with one button. All right, we have time for one final question, if there is one. All right, then... Uh, I would like to thank you very much for coming to speak to us today. Uh, it is quite rare that you speak in public and you should speak in public more because you have a lot of awesome things to say. So thank you very much for coming to talk to us. Up, we have some uh, space up and uh, some small uh, ESA and fun gifts. 
And uh, you missed this yesterday, but we actually have a master builder here uh, who makes space Lego. This is not on the market yet, but okay. this goes very well on the connection that I know that you and your wife have at home. You can build your own mini international space station awesome. from Lego. Thanks a lot. And, uh, and again, uh, yeah, huge thank you. And uh, that was a really rare opportunity that we had to watch Jürgen speak today. And uh, that was very, very pleased that you uh, decided to come and share that um, talk with us today. Thank you very much, Jürgen. Thank you. Uh, Jürgen thanks will be around. Sorry. No, just thanks a lot, Andrea. I, mean, I just want to say that um, just from what I learned this morning, I'm actually sad that I haven't been here before for the day yesterday, because I really think it's, it's impressive to see what, what is happening even outside of the agency world. And I think we should try to make much more connections um, between the, these interested enthusiasts all over the world and what's being done on a professional level. And all sides can, can really benefit from that. All right, guys, we are back into the normal session grids. Uh, they're on the whiteboard. We have sessions in here, concurrently in the lecture hall, and concurrently in the coffee area.
All right, guys, it's 11.30. If you would like to listen to the talk of Holger Foss, please come here, because we're about to start. Okay, here we go. Uh, I'm Holger Foss, uh, also known as Space Holger. So I will talk a little bit uh, about ideas to, to, uh, that can be, could be used to boosting the space topic into the public, for the public a little bit more. It's mainly about STEM, but not only. Okay, personal background. Actually, I'm an astrophysicist. I worked for the exoplanet search mission Kuro at DLR, actually, and now I'm working for uh, the Gaia ESA mission as a payload expert and uh, for, uh, for calibration aspects at the University of Barcelona. I'm also doing a little bit public outreach. And, well, Additionally to that, I'm a space geek for my entire life already, so, and the main event that is responsible for that, oh, well, we saw that in the talk uh, before, uh, it was the first space shuttle launch in 1981, actually, so, and so I was really impressed by that one, and also by the landing, so, uh, well, so I went to a sh uh, shuttle launch a few years ago, and that's really something Really, really awful. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Really, really impressive. So I will go soon to Florida again for another launch for sure. Uh, well, as I said, really, really impressive. And uh, almost every space mission is beginning with a launch, actually. And well, for many of the missions, the launch is the most impressive event for the public. But we have an issue here in Europe. Uh, there are no launches. Uh, 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 accessible for the public, so no space launches at least. So there's the sounding rockets and will be launched in Sweden, but well, sp uh, space launches are not accessible. But we may have a small alternative, especially I think that's uh, good for the kids uh, to learn something about space. Um, you can build a lot of uh, model rockets that look like the real space launchers, a little bit smaller actually, so uh, as I do, and then uh, I launch them. So, but these uh, generations of, of, of uh, scientists and astronauts were inspired by this. So do you recognize this guy actually? Anyone? Exactly. And also, Alexander Gers loves this topic. Uh, this is uh, in a recent image from December with one of my rockets uh, that is now located in his uh, flat in Köln, actually. So during the recent years, I did uh, uh, launches dedicated for, to some real space missions for the ATV-5 and 4, actually, and also for the mission I'm working on for Gaia. So for the Ariane 5, you can see, for instance, that I also experiment with launch towers and things like that to make it a little bit more realistic. And actually, that, that works quite fine, so. The latest uh, example is uh, the uh, mini IXV mission that I launched in January, uh, actually, and well, this uh, very special mission, I was able to conduct uh, the entire mission, more or less, a little bit in 30 seconds instead of the 100 minutes <laughs> of the real mission. So the IXV was really included into the payload fairing, was released and landing on, on its own parachute. So I think it's quite a nice, it's quite a nice flight on working on the first time. 
So I also did some dedicated launches to the human spaceflight mission for Alexander Gerst Blue Dot mission, also for Samantha. So these uh, videos are published on, on the blogs of Alexander Gerst and also Samantha uh, published at Half Impost uh, for two, uh, for instance, and well. So I can build any, any launcher, actually, as a model, so different sizes. Uh, I could uh, put, can put inst uh, instruments like cameras or altimeters on it. And well, I have also built the old obsolete version of the um, Ariane 6. So actually, it's a two-stage rocket, so three motors in the first stage and the same motor in the second stage. And it was quite impressive, the flight. Uh, well, I also have a flying space shuttle model, actually, so, but that's the past. Let's go to the future, the SLS, with an Orion and the European service module on top. Uh, well, but these rockets uh, you can use for several purposes. For instance, uh, for, I used it for the kickoff of the kickoff meeting of the ESA M3 Plato mission in Berlin last summer. So launching a small Soyuz launcher there in the field near the DLR. Well, and I think also the ESA launchers would need a little bit more public outreach. And well, you can dream, you can build your mini Kourou with including all the launch pads and towers and things like that. So it, and it could be transported to any place in, in Europe to do a launch actually, or do a live transmission of a launch. So, and, well, uh, but if the main application I'm thinking of is uh, actually to go into schools to do launches for, for school kids. So, in the age of maybe seven, eight, nine. So, you can imp really impress the this, uh, this school kids with that. So, and you can also add additional content showing videos about Rosetta, about the flights to the ISS, so building paper models. So, and things like that. So I did that during my holidays in, in September last year, and I, everybody had a lot of fun, including myself. So I will do that again for sure. Uh, and we have developed during the recent month with some friends uh, a nice idea, I think. Uh, do you know this uh, character, the mouse? It's a more the German thing, I think. So it's not so really well known in. in, in, in enter Europe or anyone outside of Germany? No. Okay, uh, well, actually this mouse is a frequent space flyer already. It was in orbit with Alexander Gerst last year, but also in 1992 already. So, well, it's, as I said, an experienced space flyer. But now, until the next mission of a German astronaut, it will have to wait, oh, maybe 10 years. <laughs> so, but we think, uh, we were thinking that start to, to continue the mission of the mouse to go to an exploration uh, flight. So two days ago, actually, we had the first launch. So near Bonn, which passed, uh, went to we, the mouse that is first uh, suborbital solo flight uh, uh, doing the solar eclipse uh, in the uh, fog, actually. <laughs> so, but we could not see the sun, but it was very, very impressive. And, and uh, well, we will have more launches in the future of the mouse into space. Uh, there are a lot of things planned, actually. I will, I'm constructing already a, a much larger launcher where you have a much more realistic spaceship that looks a little bit like the Orion spacecraft. And actually, we are not only thinking on launching this, the mouse and the rocket, but also do, to build models for, for in sp uh, space uh, 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 simulations, let's say. And we can go anywhere with the mouse, actually, if Mars, asteroids, or even the comet, for instance, 67P visiting Philae is an idea. And while that uh, we can build anything of, of, of future uh, space hardware as a model and fly the mouse to any place. And we can have uh, guest astronauts, for instance, like uh, Pakshi. And I think, well, it's a nice idea, that, and we will continue with that. 
So, and uh, well, in the main idea is, is to inspire kids actually to have more events like that one. Okay, that is also the idea is to expand this a little bit, but I'm looking for some kind of ideas how this can be supported because uh, the schools cannot pay for this service, actually, let's say. So, but I have talked with several people already, so there are some ideas. If you have any ideas, suggestions, please let me know. And uh, well, thanks for your attention. Any questions? Time left for questions? No, no. Um, well, a few hundred meters, but you can uh, scale the uh, desired high with using different type of motors, actually. So, so you need an area of maybe half a football field, at least, so to be on the safe side and the rocket is landing on a parachute, so it, it's drifting with the wind. <laughs> uh, there are solid rocket motors in it. So it's, you, you could call it uh, enhanced fireworks if you want, but I don't do that. <laughs> Any other question? Well, actually, I had one. Um, you launched this rocket in, in schools. How many schools already uh, had the opportunity to see that? And, and how um, do you get in contact with those schools? Uh, OK. Uh, well, I have many friends. They have children. So and uh, actually, I started this thing to do for, for private events for them. So and they were telling it in the schools. And then I get some. I'm getting some invitations, actually, so that's how it works. So mainly, I'm originally from Berlin, so mainly it's in the Berlin area so far. Thank you. Any other questions? I think we are pretty much on time, so thank you very much for your talk. <laughs> and the next speaker... It's actually Chris. Yeah, okay, me again. I did the Lunar Mission 1 talk first because I thought that would be the more, more exciting one, but obviously I'm, uh, I'm here with a branded shirt on that says ISU on it, so uh, I'm kind of obliged to, uh, whoops, I'm obliged to push the podium away. Um, I'm obliged to talk about ISU, so let me just reset my clock. And right, so the International Space University. Uh, first of all, who doesn't know about the International Space University? Because uh, you know, if everyone knows, then I'm kind of wasting my time. There's at least one, two, three people who don't afford. Phew. <laughs> Otherwise, this could make for a slightly more boring talk. So I'm from the International Space University, uh, which has its headquarters in Strasbourg in France. Um, it was founded uh, a bit over 25 years ago by some of those weird, enthusiastic space geek people who, you know, keep going around organizing things and making things happen. Here you can see them when they were looking kind of nice and young. Uh, left to right, Todd Hawley, um, uh, Bob Richards, and Peter Diamandis. Uh, Todd, unfortunately, is no longer with us, uh, but you'll have heard of some of the projects that, uh, that uh, Bob and Peter went to. Uh, later went on to, to work on and Moon Express, the, the X Prize, Zero Gravity Corporation, uh, and, and so on. Um, amongst the ideas that came out of this Space Generation Foundation that they set up was the idea of an international space university. Another was the Space Generation Advisory Council. Is Minu in here? No. Uh, we have SGAC people here as well. So ISU and SGAC, she, the SGAC share that sort of. Uh, 
uh, DNA. Um, our first chancellor was uh, Arthur C. Clarke, who I think most of you will have heard of. Uh, uh, and our current chancellor is uh, a guy called Jean-Jacques Dordain, who I think lots of people will have, uh, yeah, here will have heard of. Um, the very first activity was, a, was a, what was called the Summer Space Program, and it took place at MIT. Um, and since then, we've, we've gone on doing bigger and better things. The key thing about ISU is uh, we, are not a, we are not an engineering school, we're not a technical school. Uh, you can see here uh, our three key words, interdisciplinary, international, and intercultural. Uh, so on ISU programs, yes, there is technical stuff, but you will also find lots of, uh, lots of non-technical stuff. It, what we're trying to do is to build um, links between all these different fields. That's what we call the three eyes education. So these are the broad disciplines, if you like, that we're interdisciplinary that we cover. Engineering, science, human performance in space, space applications, you know, remote sensing, navigation, telecommunications, management and business, policy, economics and law, uh, and space uh, humanities. So very broad. Okay? You know, if you do an ISU program, yes, you'll get a lecture about orbit mechanics. Uh, you'll also get one about space art, uh, space philosophy, um, so it's, it's uh, you know, we are not scientists, engineerists, we are spacists, okay? That's how I define myself, I'm a spacist. I just happen to be a spacist who's a physicist turned engineer. So this is our map. We have about 4,000 alumni so far uh, from around 100 countries. We get very excited every time we can color in a new bit of the map. Uh, some of them are going to take a bit longer than others. I'm not sure when we will get our first student from North Korea, for example. I think that could be a, a little way off. But, uh, you know, so if you know any people in any of those countries that aren't colored in red who'd like to do ISU, you know, point them at us, because one day we want to have the whole map colored red. Um, we have on the main programs, the uh, so-called MSC in Space Studies, the MSS. I'm the program director of that, so I spend most of my time in, in Strasbourg organizing that. Uh, we have the Space Studies program. That moves around the world each year in a different location, runs for nine weeks over the Northern Hemisphere summer. That's why we changed the name. We, it was pointed out that calling it the Summer Space Program was hemispherist, because if, if it went to Australia and other places like that, it's in their winter. So we, we still tend to call it the Summer Program, but it, SSP. And then we also have the Southern Hemisphere Summer Space Studies Program. Uh, it's a five-week program that runs uh, down in, in Australia, usually uh, in January, so our winter and their summer, and a one-week executive space course. So let's just kind of give you a, a broad idea of each of these. That's the master's program. Um, we have a start off with an introduction to space module, and then we have a talk module. Uh, and a, but a key bit in the middle there is the interdisciplinary team project, what's labeled there as M3 uh, TPR, as well as an individual project. Um, somewhere in the building, I don't know, Leo, Leo Tini, who actually works here. Uh, Oh, there's Leo. Leo, Leo. Leo's a master's alum, so if you want to know about the master's, don't believe whatever I say. Talk to, talk to Leo, and he'll, he'll tell you the, the, the good bits and the bad bits. You know? Don't believe anything he says about me, though, unless it's good. You know? um, we have the, the summer program. It's a nine-week program. Uh, uh, this moves around the world. As I've said, this summer it's going to be uh, in uh, Athens, Ohio. Uh, I didn't know there was an Athens in Ohio until we decided to go there, but uh, Athens, Ohio, in, in the U.S., uh, next year it's in Haifa uh, in Israel, the year after that it's in Cork uh, in Ireland, and we don't know where it's going to be in 18 yet. Uh, so that's, a, that's a, a sort of shorter, sharper version. Uh, Leo's also done the, the, the SSP, and Ryan, who's around here, one or two others, Remco, has, has done the SSP, so you can find out to, from them uh, what, what that is like. Uh, this shows you where we've been around the world. So. Uh, Quite a lot in Europe, quite a lot in America, uh, one or two you know, visits uh, you know, to, to, to other parts of the world. So if you're from any other countries and you're interested in you know, SSP going there, we would be pleased to, to initiate talks with you. Um, yeah, and this is the Southern Hemisphere program, um, uh, executive space program, picture of executives sitting around a table. Uh, this, is, this is more sort of typically for people who who uh, are sort of working in the space sector, uh, but they don't come from a space background. So sort of finance, human resources people, uh, you know, for, for space agencies, uh, space companies, uh, they come to us in, in Strasbourg uh, uh, for a week. Um, but what does ISU mean? Why do we do all this? Well, 
the reason I sort of moved from running an engineering program in the UK to running an interdisciplinary program in, in, in Strasbourg was because I thought it was the place that I could best contribute to moving our kind of future in space forward by trying to make, in particular, the master's program uh, uh, as good as possible, turning out people who are going to go out and do kind of cool stuff in space. So it's really all about the people. It's about building the networks, uh, encouraging people to, to do new things, uh, to learn to act and to build our future in space. So uh, I, I don't know, is, uh, is Romain in the room at the moment? Romain, I hear a name check to Romain, okay. Uh, one of our organizers. Uh, this, for example, uh, is uh, you know, a recent team ISU. They've been, this is the Mars Desert Research Station. Does everyone know about MDRS? At least if they you know, go there, um, simulate being on, on Mars. Um, uh, and there are a number of teams that go there, and ISU alums have been there before. But this was the very first sort of all ISU team. Uh, and, and if you want to know more about that, uh, have, a, have a chat with uh, Roman. I wasn't sure what year Rebecca was, you know? It was 11, okay. Um, it was the year before I took over as program director, which is why I'm a little bit hazy about that. Um, uh, and then uh, you, you that, uh, MSS 12, while they were doing their internships, uh, four, of, four of my master's students set up their own nano satellite company called Nano Satisfy. Uh, they were doing, uh, they're out at Ames mostly at, at that point. They crowdsourced on Kickstarter in excess of $100,000 to start it going. They've launched three satellites with Nano Satisfy so far. They now employ 20 plus people. Uh, they've raised, actually, it's more than 25 million now. They now have offices both in, uh, in the US, uh, Scotland, and Singapore. And the name of the company is now Spire. They just rebranded. So as an example, I mean, even I was impressed by that. I'm used to ISU people doing cool stuff, but to actually found your own satellite company while you're doing the course and raise $100,000, <laughs> I was impressed. Um, here's a, a other bunch of kind of ISU people doing, doing stuff. Um, there's a, a, a team project, One Way to Mars, being presented at the IAC. The picture in the middle is ISU alumni at the the International Astronautical Congress. Uh, this is just before Christmas in Strasbourg. We had our little astronaut panel with, uh, with three astronauts there. Uh, bottom left-hand corner, our librarian at, uh, uh, in Strasbourg. I managed to persuade her to let us do this, this kind of artistic and risk-taking exercise, which basically was run by uh, an artist called Alexandra Mir, who is uh, well-known in kind of space art circles. Uh, and, and this involves stacking things one on top of each other, which is, of course is quite spacey, but it also means that ultimately you're going to fail. If you keep going, it will fall over. Uh, and it's about learning to embrace the risk, understand that the risk, understanding that you are almost certainly going to fail, and examining your own kind of reaction to that situation, particularly when you have a bunch of engineers who are used to trying to control everything. Uh, you know, you just tell them they will fail and just keep doing it. And, I thought it was very brave of the librarian to let us build things up in the library and then have them all fall down. Um, uh, other, other things, um, this uh, thing in the top left-hand corner is called SHE, the Self-Deployable Habitat for Extreme Environments. This is a, uh, a project we're working on with a consortium of people from around Europe uh, with ISU alums in a lot of the other partner organizations. Uh, at the moment, uh, this is a... This is actually a hardware-based project. It's not going to go to Mars, unfortunately. It's currently in Mars Say, though. See what I did there? <laughs> Mars Say. Uh, and it will be arriving at, at ISU over the summer, uh, and it will be used as a, as, a, as a test bed. It's a sort of collapsible um, habitat, which, when you press the button, it expands out and bits fold down, and it provides accommodation for people. Parabolic flights. Uh, this is an experiment called SMILE. Uh, spun microgravity liquid experiment, which will be going to the International Space Station with nanoracks uh, in, uh, in December, as long as no rockets go boom in the meantime. Uh, and of course, what's this thing? Space up ISU. Um, yeah, you know what a space up is, I guess. Well, we have our own space up uh, on the weekend of the 11th, 12th April, uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't encourage you all to, to come and see us in Strasbourg. I mean, you can't have too much of a good thing, can you? This one's so much fun, you're gonna want another one very soon. Uh, here you can see the uh, our little organising team. You see, we have a bust of Yuri Gagarin as well. You know, you know. So we have we have our own logo. So come to come to Strasbourg for Space Up uh, Space Up ISU. Uh, you know, if you want to know more about that, catch me later. Uh, that's it. If you have any questions about ISU, either you know, grab me or grab somebody who you know has been to ISU. 
or you can always email me or catch up with me uh, on Twitter. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Uh, are there any questions for Chris, or did you all talk to him one-on-one -on -one already? I'm in my 40s, so can I apply for ISU? Absolutely. No, we, we've, had, we've had people older than you uh, come to ISU. And, and, and in fact, uh, we have quite a lot of Chinese. We have an arrangement with China, and uh, most of the people they send on the program are, are in their 40s, late 30s. So uh, you, you would be far from being the, uh, the, the, the oldest person there. Don't worry. <laughs> I just heard the ugliest person. <laughs> it sounded like it. Sorry. Okay, who's next? Thank you very much, Chris. One, two, okay. So, um, there will be some pictures running around, and uh, what, what I would like to do with you now is to speak again about Nemo, but from a very uh, personal and intimate perspective, just to share with you what it is to live underwater. And I will go through three different uh, aspects. The night dive, which was an highlight, uh, our understanding of the underwater world, and what, it is to, what is the relationship that we develop with the module. So, the night dive is something that is not part of the mission. This is kindly organized by the, the, the mission team, just because I know that this is an awesome experience, and we were really grateful that they could organize this, because they had to work late for that. And just imagine yourself, you get out, out of the module, it's fully black, you are in the darkness, and then you turn around, and you see this module lighted with the, 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 the spots that you have outside, the, the light out of the window, and, and this ghost and phantomatic vision, like a sci-fi vision from, from the Abyss movie, you, you feel like uh, this is an alien spaceship that has just landed there. Then we are walking around, and after a while, we discovered that there was some, some light, faint light uh, above us, we were changing its shape uh, regularly, and we were, we were thinking, what's that? Did, did they put a boat over there? Is there, is there any, any spot? And what we realized is that we were looking at the full moon through 25 meters of water. Uh, and this was an impressive feeling. Then uh, I recall that uh, we had some lamps, like, uh, like this one, and uh, these pocket lamps, when we open, uh, light it up, you have a kind of uh, light beam that, uh, that is uh, then becoming full of life inside. There were a lot of uh, tiny little planktons and animals that were dancing crazy inside the light beam. And it was like, uh, like having a, a laser sword from, from the Star Wars. And uh, uh, the, the crazy thing that when you switch it off uh, and then you start to flap your hands, all these animals become bioluminescent. This was a plankton and you are suddenly surrounded by thousands and thousands of fireflies, or, or a kind of a, a, a myriad of, of, of mini, mini stars that are just around you. So just, just to, to share this experience with you, this was awesome, this was out of this world, and, and this is something that uh, the, the Nemo crew members never forget. The third aspect is um, the under, understanding of the underwater world. So I have done plenty of dives, but what I realized that this time that we do a dive, we get a, sap, a snapshot of what's going on. So you dive somewhere at a certain point of time, you see something. You dive somewhere else, another time you see something else. And you don't get any understanding of what's going on. Or you think you understand, but you don't understand. So after spending some days and in the module, and at the beginning when you look outside at the window, you have the feeling that you are in an alien world because there are plenty of things going on that you have never seen, uh, and, and you don't really understand what's going on. But after some days, you realize something, you get an understanding uh, of what's going on, and you realize that uh, you have an underwater choreography. And, and the underwater world is ruled by a kind of policy which is applied by all the fish, and they do every day the same stuff at the same time. And when the small ones are playing with the plankton or chasing the plankton, the big ones, they stay aside. They are there, but they don't bother them. Later on, it will be their time to go for chasing, and they follow exactly the same pattern. It's, it's repetitive. 
And, and when you understand that, even if there is no under com underwater communication between, between the fish, you understand that there is a kind of choreography that is, that is predefined and followed by every form of life underwater. So when you see that, you start to, to, to consider this, this underwater world and you say, you think that they have no, of course, no understanding of what it is on, on surface, what are our working con living conditions. But we have a very poor understanding of what is the, the living condition and, 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 and the way they interact each other underwater. And uh, the, the, the feeling was like, uh, we are not living on the same planet. I mean, we live on planet Earth, they live on planet ocean. And they have a completely, uh, we, this, is, this is an alien world, but after a while we developed the feeling that this world, this is their universe, their world, and we were the alien in the world. And we, are, we were not the guys in an alien world. And um, it was like if you were, we were a human being in an aquarium. And, and uh, we, we could see even some, some of the fish coming close to the window and, and peeping inside and looking what's going on. And, and, and we were really uh, becoming part of their world. So the, the, the third aspect is the special relationship that you develop with a module. And this is something very, very intimate and special. So this module is making a lot of noise. When you are on the wet porch, you hear bubbles, you hear uh, uh, valves, you hear pumps uh, starting and, and, and on. And uh, when you go on the other side of the module where it's basically um, the, 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 the way, the, the area where you sleep, it's quieter, but after a while you discover that there is a permanent noise, a kind of small crackling noise. Like, clack, 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 clack. You don't really know what it is. And we ask the technicians that were with us, what's going on? And they say, yeah, this is the life of the module. Actually, outside you have a coral reef that developed above, around the structure, and when the corals are sucking the plankton, uh, it creates this noise. So you, you, you have this, it's like if the module is alive. And something which was really surprising, that we could feel change of pressure regularly. So in, in our ears, there was a kind of pulsating uh, variation of pressure that we could feel uh, like every three and five seconds, it was increasing, decreasing, increasing, and decreasing. The same, the same situation like you have when you, you land with a plane, and suddenly uh, well, you, you, you have this feeling in your ears. And actually, what was it? It was the waves at the surface. When the weather changed on surface, the, the height of, of, of uh, water above us was increasing and decreasing, and this was uh, uh, impacting the pressure in the module. So w during the night or during the day, just by what you feel in your ears, you could understand if this is calm sea or if there were a lot of waves at the surface. In addition, the module is your cocoon to protect you from this outside world. So, but when we get out, we are always attached to an umbilical. And, 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 and like, you know, like babies attached to the umbilical of the mother. And, and when we came back, I mean, we, 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 feel, we felt like this module, we belong to us because we are operating the module, but we felt like we were also belonging to the module. We, you start to think about after some days that the module is a kind of living being that is belonging to the mission. And, and, and even I would say that uh, we, we consider it at a certain point of time as, as a kind of uh, seven crew member. And uh, this intimate relationship with your with our mothership, I would say, that you, that you develop, each of the of, of the crew members develop that. And and uh, I can tell you, when we left the module, uh, we were all really sad and really sad because we knew that there, this would be there would be no other opportunity for us to go back inside, and that we were leaving someone who I mean it was like leaving a friend that you would never see again. So uh, I just wanted to share uh, this with you. Uh, and there are other plenty of stuff that I could, could, could discuss also, like the, the change of, the, 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 the change of, of environment underwater, like uh, uh, you feel like there is a weather underwater. So uh, we were looking at the, at the outside envir environment, not like, oh, there is current, there is bad visibility, uh, uh, there is bad light, and so on. We were after a while thinking like, this is a weather. We, we t didn't talk about current, but oh, it's windy outside. Oh, uh, the, it's cloudy. Oh, it's getting foggy now. So, because you realize that there is also a kind of underwater weather uh, that develops over there. So, I, w I was just to tell you that I was really uh, astonished and, 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 and amazed but by what you can, uh, through this kind of experience, what you can develop as an understanding of the underwater world. Uh, and yeah, if you have any questions, this is the time.
questions? Questions, anyone? Where, 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 where? Oh, Ian. So are there any new NEMO missions planned right now? Um, there might be one coming up okay, this year. They are always in the same time frame because of the weather or? No, it depends. It depends on the, the type of missions. Usually it's around one week, but it can go to, uh, to 15 days, 20 days. What kind of season? I, I mean. It's usually in the summer uh, period because we, this is when the time where the, the, the weather is, is, is acceptable. And uh, yeah, it's the, the, the temperature of the water should be, should be good enough. It's around June and September, in this time frame, between June and September. No more questions? Yeah, please. Uh, is it a NASA-run facility, or uh, who owns NEMO, and do other people besides astronauts go there? Yeah, it's owned by the International uh, University of Florida, uh, and it's rented by NASA for these kind of missions. Of course, there are other uh, people who have the opportunity to, to live inside and to work inside, uh, scientists, uh, eventually tourists. Uh, if you have some money to spend and you want to go there, you can do. And you have also students, students from the, the uh, uh, Florida uh, International University. Uh, they have the chance to do that. Great. Thank you very much. Welcome. <laughs>
Is that where you're going or not? Speak loudly and slowly if you want me to hear. From where you are, can you see my light? I'd like to go from here down, here down, to where there's down, where where the vent I'm sorry, just a minute. One, one, two, two, go. Okay. It's been a long day, pretty long day. Luckily, we're back at campsite and we can sleep. So the last image that you see before you go to bed is the image of your campsite illuminated by the lights of your teammates going to bed. After that, you get total darkness. And this is what you have throughout the night. You try to open your eyes, but you don't really see much. Problem is now you wake up and you want to go to the loo. Aha, uh -huh. close your eyes now, all of you. Close your eyes and try to, close your eyes, and try to reach for your headlamp, which is down around you because you're sleeping, remember. Go ahead, close your eyes, try to touch, do it. Try to find your, no, no, do it. Please, move and try to t find your headlamp with your eyes closed. Try to touch, keep going, keep going. You have to find it, you can't go anywhere without it. It's not on your head. You were sleeping and your headlamp is somewhere around you, keep going. Well, if you really were f doing it properly by now, you have a lot of intimacy with your crewmate because you've been touching him in order to find your headlamp. But you found it and yeah, you do have a lot of intimacy with him. Now you can actually be able to go and uh, get up. It's good because you didn't realize, but by now it's 7.30, you have to get up, you have to go for breakfast, and then you have uh, to start going through your procedures because now it's time to actually plan your day. It's, debrief it's uh, the briefing of the day. The commander starts telling you what you need to do. And what you need to do today is start recognizing the area that has been mapped last year by the previous crew. So you have to go around, find whatever they actually already explored, and then by the end of that, once you reach the end of what they explored, what you need to do is now finally start mapping yourself the rest of the area. And in order to do that, you have a couple of things. You have, of course, a laser pointer. Now, if you use your laser pointer around you, and uh, Alessandro is going to do that. I actually have to be on the other side, but that's quite a powerful laser pointer. So what you need to do is to put gloves, which is quite funny because you are in a cave. And it's all very dark and you're putting these gloves on. It means that everything you touch, you stumble on. So you have to be pretty careful by now. Luckily, what you have is, luckily what you have is of course a helmet that protects you. However, you're going around, you're making a map of the cave. It's not easy. You have to make a map which is three-dimensional. And the cave is not as easy as this building. You have to render what you actually have around you. You have to start imagining how will this look like when it's coming out in the final map. And this is very important because other people will be able to explore farther. In a cave, you explore three-dimensionally. You move in the cave and the hole can be anywhere. You cannot just look in front. Anywhere is possible exploration area. Then the science team has to do some science. And doing science means um, looking for wind pattern, looking for temperature, but also looking for small animals. Now, animals are not something that you find a lot in a cave. They're hidden around. So in order to get them out, you need to put baits. So when you're there looking for animals, what you're actually doing is put your, your nose in front in, on top of a bait. Now we do baits with uh, rotten cheese and uh, meat. Therefore, you're spending half an hour with your nose on rotten cheese and meat, trying to look for little crawlers and trying to dig into earth. So that was uh, your morning. By now, you're ready to go for lunch. And luckily, Roman has provided for you some nice space food that you can actually eat, which is excellent. So you're trying space food that is, you're going to go with space with later on. But it's also time for a pee. So what you need to do is undress and start peeing. 
because you cannot be everywhere. You have to be in whatever container allows you not to leave any traces in this cave. Now, excellent. So you removed all your equipment, and by now you can start going out again. You removed this from you. Uh-huh. And you have to put it back. Good. Try to untangle this. Now you have about 10 minutes because they are all waiting for you. So your teammates are waiting for you to go. And by the way, where on earth did you leave your gloves? You need them because you will hurt your hands if you don't use them. So by now you're the last one. Everybody hates you because you've m messed everything up. You left your gloves behind you. So they have to wait for you for the next part, which is the best part because you're going to go exploring. Maybe 80, 90 meters deep. I don't know. It's huge. We can't see it. It's very dangerous. But you're going through this little tunnel and then you come out into this room and at the end there's a huge. And you really are going to find very nice places. The thing is that those places also need to be photographed. You learn how to photograph and you get into a beautiful area like this one. Now, obviously, this is a very nice photo, but you had to send your teammates up to the wall. There is a very big wall behind you. And in order for them, to lighten that up, they had to use something like this. And we had about six of them, otherwise you would never be able to see that picture. Because as a photographer, what you really need to do is to paint the cave. Without your light, with the light of just your teammates, your cave looked like this. What you want is to take very nice pictures, and you need everybody to take the next picture. But you don't just need everybody, you need to coordinate with them before you take the picture and during the picture. Because that shot, this shot that you had before, took about two hours to take. And two hours, we had people that had to stand there with this light on and light off without moving, which is terrible because, yes, the temperature in the cave is 15 degrees, but it's 100% humidity. Therefore, if you stand and don't move, you're going to get very cold. Plus, you can't really sit anywhere properly. You have to sit in, on rocks, which is not very comfortable. And you've been in the cave already for three days. So your coordination, your teamwork is extremely important in order to get to a very nice picture from this one to this. But once you get that, you're very happy. That's a success, of course, and this you will take with you for the rest of your life. Now, it's tiring. You spend actually your whole day working, so you have to go back to camp. And it's still quite a lot of work to go back to camp. It's tiring. You have to be safe. So what's very important is that your commander takes care that everybody feels comfortable. So you are in there, and you might be the happy one that is going down and still smiling, but you also might be totally tiring, so somebody has to watch. And you have to watch out for others, so if you're the happy one, you have to make sure that you don't leave the others behind. I'm learning a lot today about teamwork. Finally, I have to go to campsite, because when I get to campsite, I still have to take up water, I still have to cook my dinner, I still have to transfer all the data that I recovered today down to my computers, and I still have to talk back to ground control to tell them what we've done and to plan for the next day. As a commander, I need to check that everybody is on, online and everybody's okay. And the last thing of the day before we can finally go to sleep is the debriefing. That's where we learn what we've done today. That's where we go through all our day 
That's when we discuss. That's when we see if our commander handled us properly, if we have been successful in our teamwork, if our decision making was okay, whatever we want to do differently tomorrow, because what we learn from this is something that we're gonna take for space in our space flight. Luckily, we can go back to sleep. And finally, we can have nice dreams of our next space flight. Thank you for being on the journey with me. If you have any questions. Thank you, Lorenona. Questions? Thanks for your great talk, and it was very really interesting. Um, how long are you guys staying down there? How many weeks, days? <laughs> days, <Months>? yes. <laughs> the whole course is 12 days, but the first uh, portion, well, a little bit more, but the first portion is technical training, because in order to be able to be safe in there, you need to know how to move in a cave. You also need to learn how to do the science, because we have a science program which is very serious. And we do real science, so we have already made publications, we found new species. So we want the astronauts to really be doing science, photography and, re and um, surveying the cave. So it takes about six days. We stay six days inside the cave. And uh, one, one year we stayed five days. It was uh, a little bit short. Six days is enough, but you get very tired. I wouldn't do it any longer. So six days is a good time. It tires you up completely. This year we're going to have Alex, by the way. Thanks. I mean, uh, this is, it's a very interesting program. You're using the, the cave exploration in order to prepare to go to space. How reasonable is it now that you do actually cave exploration on another planet? How much more complicated would that be? Um, I would say that, first of all, it's very likely because uh, Moon and Mars have caves. They're lava-type caves, of course, but they're very, very large lava tubes. Uh, by comparison with the, with the Earth one, they would probably be able to host a spaceship. So they are very, very large. Um, the thing is that if you do, you're probably not going there to explore them because lava tubes are not extremely interesting to explore by themselves, but you're going there to look for possible life. So microbiology there is going to be very interesting and to be protected from the radiation environment. So yes, it's very likely. It takes a leap forward in terms of complexity because it's not just going to the, to the surface, but hey, we are explorers. Hello, uh, a question. How does the body react, react after six days without light? There is any problems, for example, for a, a sleep, no sleep time, or uh, yeah, you, we use clocks, so you, we, we use watches and alarm clocks, otherwise you would just keep sleeping because you're very tired in the evening, very, very tired, physically tired. The, it's not just physically tired, also mentally tired because you need to have constant attention. Uh, you, you're never really sure you can actually sleep everywhere and it, it will be dangerous if you're not paying attention, so you have to constantly be alerted. So you are tired, you sleep very well, but you would keep sleeping because there is nothing that wakes you up other than the alarm clock. So tendentially, when you go into a cave for real exploration, you would keep sleeping and your day becomes longer and longer. You don't know what time is anymore, so you would go exploring and you keep exploring maybe until three o'clock at night and then you sleep for 24 hours. So you have no clue whatsoever. It's very disturbing if you don't know, but well, that's what you do. But we want to keep a timeline so we wake people up and we make them go to sleep at uh, exact times. Other questions? If there's no more questions, then we will uh, close this. And have a nice lunch. Session. Thank you, exactly. And we can go for lunch now, I believe. Or can we? Okay.
session, set of sessions. If you would all, again, take your seats, please, for the ones that are going to be in this room. Okay, first up here will be um, a group of three people from uh, SGAC. And uh, please come on stage and... Uh, <laughs> this is Minu. Um, hi everyone, my name is Minu. I'm from the Space Generation Advisory Council. And uh, I thought we would just quickly speak to you about what SGAC does, and then I'm also going to leave it up to Jan. Scholarships and competitions, and also our upcoming Congress in Jerusalem. So I think most of you... You've been to our conferences before, so um, please feel free to ask them. They're very knowledgeable. Um, so what does SGAC actually do? So we came through a recommendation from Unispace 3 in 1999 that pretty much looked around the space industry and saw that the medium age of the space sector was around about 50 years old. And that's not really representative of what the space generation is. So um, SGAC was then initiated, so we represent students and young professionals below the age of 35 in the space sector. So we run two main conferences, uh, the first being the Space Generation Congress uh, in association with the International Astronautical Congress, and that travels around the world. We also have our US conference, the Space Generation Fusion Forum, which is in association with the Space Symposium in um, Colorado Springs. So the first brings about, um, or the IAC, I should say, brings about 4,000 people from across the industry, similar with the Space Symposium. So it's a really neat place to, to network and, and get to know what the industry is really doing. SGAC also has year-round projects, and I won't go into too much detail, so, but everything from exploration to commercial space, space law and policy. So really, if you're interested in getting involved, please come and see me afterwards, and I can tell you um, where to go and, and who to speak to. So as I said before, SJC is in support of the United Nations. So all of the conferences that we run, all of those recommendations are then fed back into UN Copius. So uh, we put through policy and technical recommendations, all which are representative of the next generation. As I said before, we do run competitions, scholarships and internships as well. And Phil will be talking about that a little bit later. And in addition to our um, two main conferences, we also do associated events. So I just got back from Washington, D.C., where we held a free networking event as part of Satellite 2015. And it was such a great way just to get about 60 people in a room with six different mentors from all different sectors of the satellite industry. So everything from academia to commercial to industry. It was really great. So what SGAC really does is provides a platform for you to shake hands with industry leaders, you know, people who are um, giving out jobs and internships, and really start that connection. So um, I just want to tell you a little bit about what we did last year. So, so we offered more than 75 scholarships and awards through our different programs. We ran uh, nine different conferences from around the world. Uh, we are a very global organization, so we have about 4,000 volunteer members from all across the world. So we're really trying to build up our global partnership base, and we added 17 new partners last year, all of which are growing. We had 20 presentations and papers at these conferences and over 40 presentations from all around the world. So I would definitely recommend that you be part of SGAC. Um, like I said, there's very knowledgeable people in the audience, so feel free to reach out to them or myself. Um, register yourself on the SGAC website. It's a free membership, um, and you have access to all of our scholarships and competitions. There's a talk list email as well, so um, if there's any job uh, openings in the industry, you can find out through that. 
Um, and just, I would say, take initiative. Um, Christian, uh, Sebastian, Christian, I'm sorry. Um, Sebastian is the national point of contact for Germany, so see what's going around in Germany for SJAC. And with that, I will hand over to Jan, who will tell you a bit about the Space Generation Congress. So, uh, I should introduce the Space Generation Congress. Minu mentioned all these conferences we are organizing every year. And the Space Generation Congress is the biggest one of those. So it's an affiliated event to the uh, IAC organized by IAF. And this year, uh, IAC is in uh, Jerusalem, Israel, in the uh, second half of October. And we will have the ah, Space Generation Congress uh, three days before that. So starting on uh, Thursday and running through Saturday. Uh, we are expecting around 100 delegates, so there is a lot of space for people to participate. And uh, as Minu mentioned, uh, we will have a couple of scholarship and competition. Philip is going to talk about the competitions a bit more after me and show you how to uh, get to uh, Jerusalem. And uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about the Congress. So Congress is three days, as I mentioned. We have five working groups uh, focusing on different topics like exploration, space policy, uh, satellite communication, navigation, etc. And we have also a lot of social events. This year we will organize uh, tours around Jerusalem and also maybe to Dead Sea. So it, there will be a lot of extra program apart from the work during the day. And uh, yeah, I'll ask Philip to come on the stage and tell you how to get to Jerusalem. Thanks, Jan. So as Jan said, the Space Generation Congress is as the Space Hub a very great opportunity to share your ideas among other young people, whereas the International Astronautical Congress, which is right after the Space Generation Congress, is a congress of about between three and 4,000 professionals each year and it's a prime opportunity to also present ideas to uh, more experienced people or to uh, decision makers within the space uh, business and the space world. So, if you have a great idea that you would like to get to other young people or to um, other professionals in the space sector, how do you get it there? Those congresses? How do you get to those congresses? We would like to invite you there. Every year, the Space Generation Advisory Council gives out a couple of scholarships and competitions covering accommodation to the Congresses, uh, flights to Israel, um, and the participation in those Congresses. And provides you with a slot, with a presentation slot, at both Congresses to present your ideas. This year, we will certainly have two um, competitions and one scholarship, which I will just very briefly introduced. The first one is space solar power, which addresses the idea of harvesting um, solar energy in space and then making it available for use on Earth. So if you have an idea of how such a concept could be implemented of technologies that would greatly foster the collection of energy or the beaming down of uh, energy, write it down in a paper of eight to 10 pages, submit it to us by the 31st of May, and you have a chance to um, present that paper and win the competition to present it at IAC. If you're more interested in business and economy, we also have a competition that is called a Spaces Business Competition, which basically encompasses everything that has to do with entrepreneurship and investment in space. So whether it is an analysis of the disruptive potential of micro launchers or even a historic analysis of some existing um, space market. We also invite you, it's also a technical paper competition, write it down in a paper of eight to 10 pa pages, submit it also until the 31st of May, and get your chance to go to IEC. If you're more oriented towards humanities, maybe, we will this year for the first time have the Space for Peace competition, uh, scholarship which invites you to submit us an essay about what you have done related to um, supporting or using P, uh, space to support uh, peace or space for um, uh, peaceful uses. 
whether you have uh, worked with the UN for the peaceful use of outer space, or whether you have um, worked on a project using information gathered in space to support humanitarian situations in crises, for example, this would be the, the scholarship for you. It will be announced very soon. So, um, this is the winner of the uh, 2013 of the 2013 competition, um, and could be you next year or this year. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Um, are there any questions from the audience? We have time for one or two questions. Doesn't look like it. So thank you very much again. And uh, we continue with the next talk from Guido yes, on geology on Mars, right? That's correct. OK. Hello, everyone. Uh, okay, my presentation is slightly different than the previous ones you've seen. Uh, it can be interactive as well, so if you have a question, please ask. What I'm trying to do here is just give you a very brief understanding of geology and how it's being used to trace back water on Mars. Well, I come from... Uh, an office environment, so normally we start with the topics. I skip that for now. Earth and Mars. What are the differences? I'm not going to read them out loud. You know them by heart. One is warmer than the other one. One is warmer, uh, smaller than the other one. One has a big moon, etc., etc. There's one important thing that you have to realize. Earth is a very dynamic planet. And Mars is geologically quite dead. It probably has to do with the molten core that we still have and the big moon that we have. I'm not going into detail about that. There's some similarities. It's a rocky planet. We can walk on it. It has some geological features that we can recognize. And importantly, it has seasons as well. This is a geological principle. Basically, we say the the past is key to the present. That means what happened in the past, we can still see that today. So we can still see how sedimentary layers are being formed. We still see how a volcano erupts. And we can say, okay, we see it happening now. A similar thing may have happened in the past. Um, I start with an easy one. It's the most visual one about Mars. What do things look like? It's actually a real study in geology. It's called geomorphology. Sorry. And basically, it's simple. If it looks like something, it probably is it. So what do we see on Mars? Rivers. This is actually not a picture of Mars. This is on planet Earth, so our desert. They look quite similar. So we can safely deduct this is a riverbed. Are we 100% sure? No, it may be something else than water. So we have to look for other clues. Here we say, okay, we can see that there has been something flowing around. This is a uh, meandering river. And if you can see structures like these, you know something has flown there, so, uh, like a fluid has moved there. And we see that this is Mars can see nicely how it makes the turns and curves. Another one. Another example of how you can see some liquid have, has been there. These are the so-called alluvial fans. Again, a picture of Earth. And compared to a picture of Mars, it is quite similar. And so on, and so on. Another one. I skip that for now because we only got 10 minutes. Usually these forms, the flat tabletops, are created in sedimentary rocks or rocks that have layers. Hard top layer, softer underneath. So I've 
skip this one. A bit of warning, I already told you, not everything that is liquid or everything that looks like uh, layered structure is caused by water. Oh, it's another one. This is actually being observed at the moment. We still see things being formed, gullies, like streams. And you would expect it to be formed by water. Unfortunately, it isn't. It is formed by dry ice. During the seasons, occasionally, these are formed or deformed. Okay, when it's colder, they, they are created, it warms, either become for a brief moment liquid or they evaporate and the, the structure of the surroundings, the sediments, becomes less and you see these kinds of structuring happening. There's a whole explanation, you can find it on the internet, I'm go not going to read out about it. Yeah, you can do it yourself. But this is an important picture. This is how sedimentary rocks are formed on planet Earth. If you look here, there's one thing that you can immediately see, and that is, are the horizontal layers. And there's some ways of how it's being formed. For you, it's easier to understand anything that can transport material, like water, or even yourself, that you pick up something, you drop it somewhere, that's also sediment. And we see that on Mars. Horizontal layers, nicely, nicely done. Are they formed by water? We don't know. We have to look and dig very deeply. And then we found this. This is really cool because you can see horizontal layers being cut off by another set of horizontal layers. This means actually something. I'll show you an example on Earth resembles it a little bit, and you can see how the flow of the water was going. There you go, you got another picture like that. Is this being formed by water? No, it isn't. This is an old sand dune. It's formed without water. Wind was the transporter of the sediment. And we know that dunes are Mars. I personally like these ones the most. The brilliant features, you can find them anywhere on Mars. So I just wanted to show you a few. Then there's another method, uh, methodology that I want to add on top of it. So we now know we have sedimentary rocks, we saw the layers, most likely being used and formed by water. We saw the big riverbeds and other geological features that may have been formed uh, by water. Now we have other things. First, we need to understand what do we have on the planet Mars. We have a lot of these things, volcanoes and things that come out of the volcanoes, lava basically. And you can recognize what kind of minerals and rocks come out of it by the shape of how the lava flows out. We see the sedimentary rocks I talked about earlier, but there's a lot of minerals as well. And we use the minerals. We know out of this volcano, most of the times, basalt. It's kind of rock coming out. If these have certain types of minerals. And if these minerals come in contact with water and, say, oxygen, certain other minerals are being formed. So-called clay minerals, for example. And we have found them quite a lot. Uh, the, the red stuff is where the clay is. This is a bit on where we found them on Mars. And I particularly like this picture because it clearly sees that on the highlands you hardly see any clay. But what looked to be something where a lot of water would have been flown in, there you see a lot of clay. Also, this is found, the so-called Mars blueberries. Uh, there's this mineral, a hematite, that is, uh, caused quite a lot of staring 10, 20 years ago, because this was deemed as one of the proof that Mars originally had water. These minerals are indeed formed, usually in water-rich areas. So you have to see them, like there's some iron in the soil, 
water seeps in, gets the, oh, yeah, I'll hurry up. And they form these nice little bulbs. Now this is what most recently has been discussed. This big ocean of Mars, how did they determine it? Basically by using that one, heavy water. Normally an hydrogen atom has a proton and electron, but there's also occasionally an hydrogen that has a, uh, a neutron attached to it. The funny thing is, it still acts as water, but it is slightly heavier. So if there's no Mars, the lighter materials disappear into space. The heavier stuff remains. So if you have originally, say, as an example, one heavy stuff versus 10, and 50% of the light stuff goes away, your ratio becomes a lot denser. So you can calculate how much water there was initially. And they calculated that there would be a Mars uh, ocean, basically where the blue bits are. And that's it. Sorry, I have to rush to it. Where can we find it, the water now? Because it's definitely not on the surface. We use an old-fashioned technique. We can drill for it, pump it up. It's probably somewhere in one of those aquifer, uh, uh, groundwater layer. And yeah, that opens up our future for Mars. Sorry. That's it. Questions? <laughs> Well, thank you, Guido, and um, I open the floor for questions. How deep do you think one would have to look for that water on Mars? That's a good question. Uh, you don't probably have to dig deep on Earth. On Earth, it is, you have to look how deep can the Sun or Mars, have, that water evaporate. You only leave a few meters, and then it's pretty safe against evaporation. There's actually evidence that water still seeps out on some places. Uh, there was a picture earlier of uh, sedimentary rocks. They think occasionally water still seeps out there, so that's where they have to look for. In, in, on Earth, you see in sedimentary layers, quite often uh, a layer made out, for example, of the clay materials, so it's, it's watertight. And if you find one of them, there you got a surplus of water underneath. So it could be only a few meters, it could be 100 meters. Yeah. Some more questions? No. Okay, well, thank you, Guido. Yep. Well, um, I think, yeah. All right, we are really good in time. Um, we have now enough time to switch the rooms. There will be one talk in the lecture room on a startup in uh, CubeSets, in the CubeSet industry, I think. And in here, we have a talk on the one thing ESA uh, does right. So you have no time to change the room. So if you want to stay, and then we continue. One. Is it working? Is it Super interested and busy. Right, that was a thing. Okay, uh, hello everybody. <coughs> I want to talk about one thing is at us right, and just a disclaimer for the title is not the one thing is at us right, okay? So it's just one of the things that, that is at us right. We all know that is at us a lot of things right. 
Uh, but uh, I'm talking within the context of uh, participation and collaborating with the general public. Um, by that I mean with the people outside the space pros uh, communities. Uh, so first of all, I want to tell you about where the idea for this talk uh, came from. I, in the last year in the Space Hub in Toulouse, I gave a short talk about the space software and about how to build software because I thought that that is something that ISA is doing wrong. Uh, and I don't want to repeat that talk here, but the main point was that ISA is not taking advantage of the open software and the open software communities. And there are a lot of people that would happily contribute code and knowledge to the development of software at ISA, but ISA is close to that kind of thing. So. Um, I ended up that talk with a wish list that you can see there. This is a fake screenshot that I made up uh, where I include a menu that I would like to see in the ISA website where you can go to uh, the list of all the projects that are available to contribute, a guide on how to contribute code, uh, that kind of things. Links to all the code repositories of the agency. That would be great, I think. And uh, as a software developer myself, I think that is the future. So we only have two options there. We can, the ESA can pioneer there, that would be great. Or NASA will do it and then we will do it because it's, it's working for NASA. So I prefer the first option, obviously. And um, the thing is that after that talk, uh, I love ESA, but uh, I felt a little bit bad, a little bit guilty talking about something ESA is doing wrong. So uh, coming here, I wanted to talk about something ISA does right, and that is uh, learning and education. I think ISA is providing uh, very good uh, resources for learning, and the uh, Rosetta mission was like a peak on that kind of things. So I just want to talk about a small story, a successful story of using the resources that uh, ISA provides. Well, I live in a small town, uh, 40 kilometers north of Madrid. And there, in the public school, and at the beginning of this course, in last September, the teacher of the class of the six-year-old kids uh, tell us, the parents, that they were going to spend that uh, first uh, quarter talking about the universe, uh, presenting things like um, the sun, the stars, planets, that kind of basic things on astronomy and space to the small kids. And I think that was a great idea and I knew that uh, in November the meeting with Rosetta was coming and I suggested her that she could at least mention the mission during the, the, uh, the program with the kids. And she thought that actually that was a great idea but she needed some materials to prepare the classes about the Rosetta mission. So, so I, I went, went to, to the, the looking online for things that I could give her and I found great, great videos uh, from ESA and also from, also from other agencies like DLR, uh, great videos explaining the mission that were really useful for the kids. They are all translated into different languages and of course the great videos uh, with the cartoons that you probably have seen already that were really engaging with the kids and they love that kind of things. And not also this kind of multimedia resources you could even download from the ISA website paper models of, uh, of Rosetta, of Phile and this kind of things. So with this uh, base the teacher prepares some classes and prepares some activities with with these models and then we wait to see if the kids like it or not and the result was much better than we expected it was actually it was awesome that is my six-year-old daughter super happy going to school with her Rosetta model <coughs> and the kids tell that that was the part during all the quarter that they love the most so when they finish the quarter they decide to create a mural for the entrance of the classroom and they choose Rosetta and Philae to, to put up there. Uh, actually, it was a great success. It was something that they talk about in the classroom and the timing was great. So then they, they went home 
and they find the same things in the news that they can talk with their parents at the same time. And it, it went beyond what we expected. Uh, there was one day that I went to the school to talk with the teacher and the kids were, were all playing in the schoolyard and they were playing hide and seek, but they had changed the name of the game. They were playing Rosetta. So the team uh, hiding were comets and the team of people looking for the other ones were filais. And you, you, can, you really uh, can hear all the children shouting around, hey, I'm filai, I'm going to find you, Comet, I'm going to find you. It was awesome. <laughs> so uh, they were basically asking for more. Uh, and I went to the ESA website, and they provide even the 3D files, the files for 3D models of the, of the P of the 60, 67P Comet, right? And so we can print with any 3D printer things like this for the kids to play, to actually touch the Comet and play with it. <coughs> of course, they love that thing. And, and basically, it was a great, great success. So um, the message here is that uh, they really love these kind of things. Uh, if we, I think the success of this the space agencies and these are, uh, also depends on how the, the perception of the normal people, of the general public is about their missions, about their activities. And if we want to, the people to be engaged with the, with the space, we have to start with the small ones. And uh, if you get a, a six-year-old to get in love with the space, that's a person that will be in love with the space for the rest of her life. So this is a very good way to, to show them. Uh, this is the current website for kids that ISA has. Uh, it's okay, uh, but I think it's too focused on kids. Uh, anyway, if there's someone from ISA working on this kind of things, I just want to say thank you, because this, the resources you have there are great. And they are doing great, they are, they are doing it great, but I think there is also room for improvement. Um, if you see this website, uh, nobody over 12 will go there to find anything. But, uh, so I will also like to finish with a wish list. And it's something like this. <clears throat> because the paper models for Rosetta are great, but why stop there? Where are my Astro Samantha paper model? Where are my Alex paper model? Where are the 3D files for any other spaceships? Uh, and actually, why stop there? Why do not open a little bit to collaboration from the public? This, of course, that is a fake uh, screenshot. Uh, I would like to, to be able to contribute things back. I will, in this kind of things, uh, the connection with ISA looks from the outside uh, that it's always a little bit unidirectional. You cannot all come back to ISA and there is like nobody's listening to you. I would like to, I don't know, maybe upload a file of this same model, but modified to include a, a small fillet upside down somewhere or with the with landing sites marked with flags or whatever. If you open that to collaboration, people will, will upload amazing things that you cannot think of. Maybe there people will put up, I don't know, paper models of the Eurocom working on, the, on her panel, and that would be great. And that is also a website that is not targeted only to kids. Kids will go there to find something, but also I can see teachers or parents going there, or even teenagers or college students uh, going, to, going to find uh, files for playing with 3D printers. Uh, anyway, uh, the materials are great. I think there are room for improvement, but please keep them coming. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Not mine. It's, for, it's from a six-year-old. You don't want to take her for her heart. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you have the files available, so you can print it yourself. Somebody else? So you think that the data not project that was uh, presented yesterday could be a good uh, venture to start this kind of activities? 
Oh, I uh, was in the parallel talk, so I didn't see that. Well, talk. I think but you should see that then. Okay, I will. Because it, it, was, it was definitely, to me, a good venture to uh -huh. probably start discovering, not, not the educational part, but the open source. Uh -huh. the okay, part. sure. Yeah. So uh, I work for ASA Communication, so I just want to say thank you very much for passing on all those uh, compliments and, and, and confirming what I think we sort of knew about some of the good activities we do and the good efforts, the downloadables and all the other stuff. So thank you very much. And uh, in terms of the, uh, where you'd like to see some improvements or some changes or some, some other activities, uh, the head of ASA Communication is watching the webcast right now. So. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're speaking right to the, okay. to the top. Yeah, I, agree. <laughs> I, th I think that the, the main point is that it's not so difficult to provide good things. I mean, you don't need to, to give us big text with lessons of how a space works. You just give us a st good stories and characters and let the parents and the teachers and the, if you're uh, someone with nephews, you are ready for to play with all these things. So making things available are great. Right. Definitely. Yeah. Somebody else? Okay, I guess not. Okay. So yep. thank you very thank much. Thank you. <laughs> so, right? It was, so it was fun. <laughs> um, right, now we have one more talk in here, which is about Nemo, the project Nemo. And uh, there will be a second talk from Alex. Um, a quiz, sorry, a quiz from Alex. Yeah, it's, it's kind of silly. It's just win a prize and uh, recognize uh, people that were important in the way to space. But it's like with covered squares and you uncover a square as you, uh, and as you go, you, the first one who, who, who guesses is right gets a prize. Okay, thank you. Uh, are you bored with Nemo? No? Okay. So I promise this is the last talk for the weekend about this topic. You can stay one more week. <laughs> so we, we, we got the, you got the presentation yesterday about how similar the situation is when you are a crew member uh, in Nemo and a crew member in the space station. And if you can send the pictures in parallel, uh, yeah. And uh, this morning you got a more intimate presentation about uh, what, do, what it is when you live underwater and what are your feelings and, and your thoughts. Now I will uh, talk about the EVA program and what we did in NEMO, why we did EVAs, uh, what it is about. So, uh, there should be some picture that we'll, we will run around here so, uh, as soon as possible. So what, what we did in NEMO, you know that this mission, NEMO 19, was uh, simulating a mission with a permanent time delay of five minutes between the Aquarius module where the crew wa was and between the control center. And uh, in this, uh, this five minutes delay are typically the type of delay that you can have between the Earth and Mars. When the Earth and Mars are in opposition, they are close together. You have the Sun, the Earth, and Mars. Uh, and this is typically what, what could be. So we were simulating a mission where basically uh, we were doing exploration first around asteroids or moon of Mars in microgravity. And then we were supposed to be landed on the Mars planet and, and to do exploration. So the, the objective where for, the, for NASA to define how a crew can, become, can be autonomous in the scheduling and the implementation of an EVA. Because you can imagine that if you have a question, you cannot ask the question and wait for 10 minutes to get the feedback. And uh, how we can anyway find a solution to have the ground control giving enough support to the crew. So we did different types of EVAs. Uh, the first one was about around um, a structure, which was a boom uh, that we could deploy. Uh, and we have like this one, you see. And at, at the extremity of this boom, we put a drill machine. And the objective was to drill, to do, co to do so core drilling in the surface to get some sample from, from deep uh, from below the surface. So we did this in microgravity, uh, in neutral buoyancy. Uh, and then we did exactly the same EVA later on, but in partial gravity with additional way to simulate the Mars gravity. So we are going outside each time for four hours. We did another uh, um, similar uh, EVA 
with uh, uh, instead of replace, we replace the, the, the drilling machine by a foot uh, restraint platform. And we are also assisted by, by a, ro a robot, kind of rover that was floating around and uh, piloted by one of the other crew members inside Aquarius. So in these simulations, uh, with, we were attached by the feet with a foot restraint platform and we were doing some sampling of the soil, sampling of, of rocks or ship sampling on big rocks. Uh, and you can see here uh, the platform that we are deploying. Uh, and uh, basically, one astronaut was attached at the extremity and could rotate, uh, could, uh, could do the work, while the other one was rotating the boom. And uh, we had a position where we were 45 degrees on the left, then we extended the boom, then 90 degrees on the right, and then we retracted the boom. So there were four locations to, to, to perform the activity. And we did it in microgravity and in, in 1G. We had also this also fancy uh, vehicle, uh, to kind of diver delivery system that was, uh, we could use a kind of underwater GPS uh, to pilot it. And this was for the last EVA type of EVAs where we did exploration, like you can see here, uh, on the surface of Mars. And these explorations, basically, we are using a map like this one. And uh, we had uh, four big sites to, to explore. And from each site, we had to radiate in different directions to find uh, six different geological features or, or elements that were supposed to be mapped already by ro rovers and that we had to, to go for exploration. And when we found the object, we had to do some measurement, uh, the orientation uh, compared to the, to the waypoint and the different size. And we took pictures. And when we did the, the, the pictures of these, uh, of these uh, elements, we continued to do the exploration the pictures were sent to the ground. The ground received them five minutes later. They did the analysis, and then the specialist in the back room said, oh, here we have a specific feature that we see on, this, on, on your photo, and this is much more interesting than one you have seen. So we want you to go back there and to do the analysis of this, and then to find another feature like that but on your own. So what we did, the strategy was to come back after 20 minutes, 30 minutes, to the same exploration point, and then we got the information from the IV astronaut inside the Aquarius who received the picture and the, the recommendations from, um, from the ground control and he, he told us, okay, now if you recall the one that you have seen, if you go more on the left side in this direction, such a distance, you should find something which looks like that and this is where you, you have the new feature that the, the scientists are looking for. And then we identified, we, we, sh he could show, uh, we could show that on the camera and say, no, oh, that's the right one. And, uh, um, then we have to find another one by yourself. Uh, <clears throat> so this strategy works very well, we don't lose time. What I also, want, also wanted to mention is that uh, this is not only sim exploration simulation, we are talking about real explorations. Uh, uh, many times during the EVA, uh, and there were some EVAs that we developed on our own, we decided to go at, on different sites uh, on our own, uh, one, one on, uh, on each site. And I recall one EVA, for example, when I was about 75 meters away from, from Aquarius, I was 50 meters away from Andreas Mogensen. The visibility was 10 meters, so which means that the only thing that you see is that your umbilical is vanishing in the, in the blue after 10 meters. You feel, uh, and, and the divers that are supporting us, after a while, they have to come back to the boat to, to refill their tank. And so you could uh, find yourself in such a situation that for 30 minutes or more, you are alone. Alone, you don't see anything around, you hear your partner, and you have to find uh, something that, uh, on a location that you don't know where it is, and you don't know uh, the environment, and you have some maps, and you have to find out. And we were really thinking at that time, wow, this is, this is not a, no more simulation. We are really doing exploration. And, and the fact that by these missions, NEMO missions, they can put the crew members doing an EVA in, in a state of mind where they feel that it is real, that they really do in, uh, an exploration. This is uh, very important for the feedback uh, and for, for what we can get out of, uh, of, of, this, uh, of these missions. So here you see uh, some of the core, uh, some of the, the, the chip sam sampling that we did uh, with, uh, when we are attached by the feet. And you, you have seen also uh, in, in these pictures uh, when we did the exploration. So we used uh, a kind of... Uh, wheel to measure the distance, and uh, we had also a kind of compass uh, to, to check the orientation. 
Do you have questions? Thanks for your talks about Nemo. Uh, you want mo one more? <laughs> no, just kidding. What do you miss the most about being there? This is what I told the mo this morning, the module, the module, the experience. The, let's say the, the EV experience was amazing, uh, for sure. Uh, the uh, space station-like crew experience was also great. What I miss more is the underwater experience and the, the, the feeling of being part of this module and what I told this morning. Because we know that we will never go back. I mean, I will, I will keep on supporting the missions, but, but I cannot go back again in the module. There will be other astronauts that will rotate there. I will support them uh, the best I can, but uh, this is an experience of one, uh, one experience uh, in your life. Is it on? Yeah. From a planning perspective, did your ground team know that you were doing 20-minute rotations? For instance, would they give you your instructions five minutes? Yes, later? this was already pre-agreed. So this was a strategy that we developed with the ground so that we, we, we could uh, have uh, enough time for them to analyze the, the images and the data that we were sending so that they can se send the information back with a time delay and then we came back at the same location. So we were not waiting, they were not waiting. It's just that uh, you do the exploration you repeat uh, your, 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 your cycle. So did you, for instance, did you hear, uh, was, it, was it like you were talking with no delay? Did you get the instructions as you came to the site? We got uh, real-time instruction from the, EVA, the IV astronaut inside uh, Aquarius. So with our partner inside Aquarius, which is like the one inside the space station when you are outside for an EVA, with this guy we're in real-time talking. And uh, the ground control could listen to this talking, but only with five minutes delay. And what was great also is that they let us, for the last uh, EVAs, to develop ourselves, our strategy, and say, okay, now you guys, you are fully autonomous in the decision because you know better the, the setup and the, and, and the environment than we. Uh, but, of course, the day before, we had a briefing and we had to explain what was our plan and to have this agreed by the ground control. There is never the situation where you say, oh, I want to go uh, outside and let's see what I can uh, look for. All right, thank you very much. Thank you for yeah. the talk. You're welcome. And last but not least, uh, we have one more presentation from Romain on his uh, Mars 500 um, project. And if you want another talk on Nemo, just come the next weekend. Just come back. Good afternoon. Um, so, I will try to be short and talk about uh, Mars 500. We have 10 minutes left before the big event and uh, the keynote of Frank after that. So, first, Mars 500. Some of you already know what is this mission, but I will just uh, explain a little bit and uh, talk a little bit about what this uh, scientific mission is. Um, Mars 500 is a mission which was organized by the Institute of Biomedical Problems in Moscow and the ESA, the ESA, European Space Agency, and later joined by the Astronaut Center of China. Uh, the idea was to answer a question. The question was, is man psychologically and physiologically able to endure the confinement of a trip to Mars? In other words, can we live together as a crew for an extended period of time in these 520 days, so roughly one year and a half. So here you have the crew, the, the crew of the 520 days study, uh, with the three Russians, two Europeans, and one Chinese. So Alexei in the center bottom is our, was our commander. On uh, his right, on our left, is uh, Sukrob, our crew surgeon. Uh, just above in the middle is a third Russian, uh, Alexander, who was our specialist and uh, the commander of the Martian mission. I will come to that a bit later. Top left, Van Yue, our Chinese colleague. And on the right, the two Europeans, so Diego at uh, the bottom, flight engineer, and myself, uh, board engineer for this mission. This mission was in Moscow. 
Um, we were living together for 520 days in mainly three cylinders, three modules. The biggest one was the one below the big red um, arc. It was the storage module where we had the food and the clothes and all the things that we would need for this long mission. The second and most important module for us was the living module, which is um, the longest one at the bottom. Inside this module, roughly the size of a bus, you had six rooms, one control room, one bathroom, one kitchen and one living room. And you can see the kitchen and living room on the right. So now you have the crew, you have the setting, where it happened, uh, what happened during those 520 days. Well, first, it started on the 3rd of June 2010. The six of us entered this door in the back, and this door just um, was sealed for the next year and a half. Inside, our work was to do scientific experiment to understand how the body would evolve. And, um, those experiments were divided in big groups. The first one were, was psychological experiment. Here, you can see Diego, who is learning with a tool to um, dock a Soyuz to the uh, ISS. The idea is to see how can we learn new skills inside confinement. Is it uh, still it's efficient? And uh, how does it go with, uh, with the body? So you can see a lot of electrodes all over his body to understand how he's reacting to this um, training. Other experiments were uh, physiological experiments. And uh, because we had a lot, like more, more than 100 experiments to do, some of them, when you look at them the uh, first time, looks a bit strange. For example, this experiment is called uh, pain tolerance. And you can see on my arm, I have a thermocouple, so like an iron, which is heating more and more and more and more. And when it's uh, not bearable anymore, I have a red button on my uh, right hand, and I just press it. And don't worry, I took this picture and I made this face. I would stop much before that. Um, and so the idea is to see how is our pain tolerance evolving when we're in confinement. Because when you go to Mars, when you arrive on Mars, you have to hold on your shoulders and your head a 30 kilogram spacesuit, and that can be painful after some time walking around. And um, so if your pain tolerance decreases, then we can have a problem. So even though the study can look strange or funny at first, there is always some questions, scientific questions, questions behind. behind. So this is more a uh, physiological experiment. The typical physiological experiment, and I will not go too deep on this one, looks like that. Electrodes all over the body. And we have to do either some task or to rest and gather data. Another physiological experiment, which was actually very important, is the food. And um, I can talk about it a bit later, but food definitely is important in space and on Earth, I'm sure. The, the other last type of experiments were linked to the environment. And um, so this is Diego taking some samples on uh, aluminum some, because, you know, six guys living in a closed environment, it lives too, you know, or things live inside this environment. But back to what happened during those 520 days. We had, quite quickly, some routines um, uh, starting with uh, our crew, and we were getting more and more, um, doing tasks more and more monotonously. So we tried to have some events to give some energy to the crew. Some events, we would decide them. So this one is Halloween. For none of us, Halloween is very important. But we said, ah, let's celebrate Halloween. Let's put on some costumes and spend the whole day working with those costumes. So that was definitely um, a fun day. And um, it, gives us, it gave us some energy for the next uh, days and weeks after that. And some other events, we didn't ask for them. All of a sudden, um, we didn't have any more power. And so you can't see a lot, but that's normal because no power for us, it's no light, only the security lights, no ventilation, and no water. Uh, but so we stayed like that for 22 hours. It was not very nice, but after that, when we talked about it, well, it was fun. It was something different. And um, so if we decide them or not, 
different events are definitely something which stays and helps us to go forward. But Mars 100 was about Mars. So we wanted to reach this red planet. And in February 2011, we arrived on Mars. And that was the highlight. It was like a second Christmas because, because we reached our goal, our somebody goal, even though it was on Earth, but still. And then because the habitable module, the Martian lander, didn't have anybody, it was stacked with the food and the clothes and everything for the way back. So when we opened it, finally, after eight months of traveling, it was Christmas. It was like full of new food, full of new clothes. It was just great. And three of us went further in isolation and arrived on the Martian surface. Once again, it was not the real one. And uh, they did some spacewalks in um, um, Orlan E costumes. So it's the Russian um, EVA suit, but modified uh, by Zvezda. And so you can see Diego, Alexander, and Vanue, who spent two weeks and did three EVAs on the Martian surface. And soon after, they came back to the main module, and we started the way back. The way back was a bit like that, kind of boring. It's more a personal feedback that I give you because it was a bit different for each of us, but it really felt like there is not a lot to say or to see about it. So this is just uh, the corridor in the living module with all the rooms on the left, you can imagine, and the hatch going to the gym. Um, but this diff period was a bit more difficult, but luckily we had a team and not the down periods were the same for everybody. So to cheer us up, we had birthdays. Those were very important. But we also had a lot of uh, personal activities. And just to cut the story short, on the 4th of November 2011, the whole crew exited the modules. And I think the main success of Mars 100 was that we were six when we entered um, in June 2010 and we're still six and still working together when we exited the modules in November 2011. And with that, I thank you. Thank you, Romain. Um, I think we skipped the, the question. I'm sure you have a ton of questions for, for him, but uh, I'd say we do a little refreshment break. Um, quickly, you can grab a drink and uh, please return back here so we can start at... Uh, Quarter to three with our final highlight um, and the, to the keynote speech of uh, Mr. Frank, the winner, uh, in here. So please be here on time. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, um, welcome to the final session of Space Up and our very special guest speaker and uh, the man who actually runs this whole center at the European Astronaut Center. Well, come on. <laughs> and is very humble about it, not even joking. Uh, so without anything else, I will uh, introduce you to Belgian astronaut Frank Devin. Thank you. Okay, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. I hope that you had uh, a very nice uh, two-day stay here in this uh, wonderful uh, little center, but uh, I still think it's wonderful. Uh, I'm still sometimes amazed when I come to work here, and uh, this is your daily workplace. I think we can all be very lucky for all the people that, uh, that work here in the center to, to be around here. I'm going to talk to you a little bit uh, today about uh, my space mission. 
Uh, but I'm going to try to make a little bit of a link as well with future exploration and what we are thinking, what we will do with ESA in the, in the near future. And then, of course, uh, after the, the talk, which will last about 20 minutes, uh, I think we can uh, do all kinds of uh, question and answers into any topic that you would like to. Heinz, if you can start the movie, please. So you see here five partners that take part in the International Space Station, as you know. Uh, NASA, Roscosmos, uh, JAXA, Canada, and also Europe. Five partners are the partners of today. Uh, but you know if you want to explore, or we think at least in Europe, if we want to explore uh, towards uh, the future, uh, the Moon, Mars, certainly, that we will have to open the partnership and that we will have to have an open partnership with more partners. And there, of course, in the first place, we think about China. And actually, uh, our center is one of the pioneers in working together with our Chinese colleagues. And uh, we have uh, already several uh, uh, meetings together with our Chinese colleagues. And one of the highlights this year is actually going to be, I see that Loredana is standing there. Uh, she has probably briefed you about the CAVES program. Well, this year we will have a Chinese taikonaut in the CAVES program, together with Russians, with Europeans, with Japanese and with Americans. The first time that we will have a multilateral crew, including a Chinese, doing space training. So here you see the launch vehicles uh, that were used uh, during my time. Uh, we had the Soyuz uh, on the right-hand side, the shuttle on the left-hand side, which is not flying anymore. Uh, but both vehicles, after about eight minutes, we were in space and uh, looking forward to get to the space station. The Soyuz, of course, very small, if you see that up there, where the crew is sitting very cramped. Uh, you know that now the U.S. is uh, looking into commercial crew vehicles, so this is also something that is coming our way. As of 2018, normally we should have a commercial crew vehicle that augments the number of Western astronauts on the space station to four. This will be for us very important because that would al almost mean a doubling of the utilization time uh, on board of the space station. You see here when crew are, are arriving, a lot of uh, smiling faces. Of course, when you're living there for six months in a confinement with uh, uh, very small spaces with always the same faces, if you see people arriving, you're of course very happy. I can tell you it's almost like when your uh, parents-in-law come to visit you. You're very happy when they arrived. You're also very happy when they leave again because... <laughs> They, they mess up a little bit the space station, of course. They are not used to be there. They don't know the environment so well. So whenever they leave, you have about one or two days of uh, cleanup uh, to do. Uh, this is the, the most difficult task. I think Hervé has already talked a lot about it, it uh, our uh, EVAs. Certainly the, the most interesting task to do as an astronaut. Unfortunately, uh, I did not uh, do one. Um, but we have now our young astronauts like uh, Luca will uh, do an EVA, uh, the, did an EVA, Alex did an EVA and also on the future astronauts we are working that they will get some uh, EVA experience. It's very uh, demanding both from a physical point of view because it's very heavy to work in the suit. Uh, it's also very demanding from a psychological point of view because you're outside of the space station in this very tiny space suit. Uh, and you're on a timeline, you're on a clock. The moment that you go out, you're on a clock to finish all the tasks that are scheduled for you. So you really don't have any time to lose uh, while you do that. It's really very demanding. It's also a little bit dangerous, of course. It's one of the most dangerous activities. That's why we try to do a lot with robotics. As you see here, here we were installing the uh, GEM uh, platform. Uh, here you see Julie and uh, Tim. Copra, who will fly uh, in December this year again to the space station uh, as the commander together with uh, our uh, English, Timothy Peake. So installing some payloads on the outside of the, the GEM platform. Uh, international cooperation, as we already talked, uh, this is really the core of our business. If you look here, this was the first HTV that arrived at the space station. Uh, it was operated by myself. Uh, the robotic arm, which is Canadian there, you see, was operated by Nicole to grab all the HTV. We had 99 seconds to complete that maneuver. You see a little bit there the hands as the safety officer that was Bob Tursk, uh, a, uh, a Canadian, and it's all under the command of a Russian commander. And of course, all the, the, the stations, the ground stations, were working to support this activity. So 
international cooperation is not sitting just around the table and having meeting and signing papers. It's really day-to-day -day business of the people that, uh, that work on the, on the ISS. So uh, here, uh, the success of the, of the HDV that we received uh, for the first time with our Expedition 21 uh, crew. Uh, another important part of uh, today's work in the space station is uh, logistics. Uh, if you live and work there with six people, of course you need uh, food, you need clothing, you need uh, spare parts, you need uh, new scientific uh, experiments. So here you see myself with uh, my colleague Christoph Fugelsang from uh, Sweden. Very nice to be with a European colleague on board of the space station. Opening the MPLM, an uh, Italian uh, uh, cargo vehicle that was arriving and here you see that uh, doing cargo transfer in the space station is uh, a little bit different than how you would do it here on, on the ground. Uh, you can see here for example these are food containers that we are uh, transporting back and forth to the cargo vehicle. We also have Russian cargo vehicles coming. This is a, a progress that is uh, arriving and here you see Max Surayev that is uh, ready to take over manual control in case that something would go wrong with, uh, with the docking there. Russian vehicles are very much appreciated. I think Roman talked, talked a little, little bit, bit about, about the importance of food in Mars 500. It's the same in the space station. The food is very important. So the Russian vehicles, they always bring fresh food because uh, they have late access until the day before the launch. So they can put some oranges, apples, uh, name it. And the Russians always put also garlic on board of their vehicles. Very interesting. So when you open up the vehicle, you have this nice garlic smell. Uh, and also you learn to eat raw garlic with uh, Russian bread on board of the space station. Very interesting. Uh, here you see uh, another activity, which is science. Of course, we do a lot of science. This is a mice drawer uh, built in Italy, actually. We had six mice on board of the space station doing research on uh, osteoporosis. Uh, here, Bob Tursk is uh, looking to some neurophysiology uh, experiment that he is installing uh, and that he will be doing later. Uh, Mike is here doing some combustion research. Uh, looking to how uh, combustion works in microgravity. Uh, here you see myself doing some research with water, uh, also wearing a UNIT UNICEF t-shirt. Uh, I'm also a goodwill ambassador for UNICEF. As you know, uh, today more than a billion people do not have access to clean drinking water on the earth. And uh, the water problem, sweet water problem, clean drinking water is really going to become one of the issues of uh, this century. Uh, especially in uh, countries or, or continents like, uh, like Africa. So we did a lot of research uh, on water. We recycle already a lot of water on the space station. Actually, we recycle 70% of the water. So all our sweat is recycled. Uh, our urine is recycled on board of the space station. So uh, we used to say the coffee that we drank yesterday is the same that we drink today and the same that we drink tomorrow. So uh, something to get used to. Also, you don't only drink your own coffee, you also drink the coffee of your crewmates. So uh, uh, also something that to think about. Uh, here spheres, for example. These are satellites flying in uh, formation. Uh, very important as well for the future, uh, if we look to climate change, we will have a number of satellites that uh, will do research, uh, Earth observation research, flying information. Also Europe has a program, Proba3, in which we will have two satellites flying information, looking actually to the sun. So we had an eclipse yesterday, uh, this is rather rare. Uh, to observe this. Well, with Proba3, we will actually be able to make our eclipse ourselves. So we will have two satellites flying information. One will obscure the sun, and the other one will then look to the corona. Uh, here you see uh, plant research. Of course, if we want to uh, fly further than, than low Earth orbit to the moon, to Mars, for extended periods of time, we will have to recycle a lot more. Uh, and this can only be done not with chemical systems as we do today, but with biological systems. So we do a lot of plant research in that area. Uh, Europe, for example, has a program called MELISA, in which we try to have a full closed loop cycle, uh, also recycling all human waste. Roman is uh, demonstrating there our fridge, not to store uh, ice cream, but to store all the samples that we are taking. Uh, this is another activity that we need to do a lot on uh, board of the space station, is uh, exercise. As you know, in microgravity, uh, you're, you would get a lot of bone loss, you would get a lot of muscle loss. So you need to exercise a lot, two and a half hours per day. 
This is our new fancy ARAT machine that is uh, very useful and uh, reduced a lot the bone loss in the, in the astronauts today. You see Nicole here doing some exercises and me in the back there, 90 degrees, uh, because of course you don't have gravity, so you can do it in any direction. You don't need a saddle to cycle, so you see our bike doesn't have a saddle. If you run, however, you need of course to have a harness to keep you on the, on the rolling uh, uh, platform. And uh, here Max is demonstrating that in microgravity at least it's a little bit easy to get uh, some rest. And Tim is demonstrating that not all exercises military people do on the ground are also effective in, uh, in space. But nevertheless, here you can see the result. Uh, quite some uh, good, uh, good fitness uh, people there. Uh, Nicole is taking us through uh, a tour in the space station. Here the Canadian flag and the Japanese module because it was the home of uh, uh, Bob Tursk, my Canadian hero. He was uh, living in the gym. Here myself with the Belgian flag in the Columbus uh, laboratory. I must say that the Columbus lab is one of the most uh, busiest and used laboratories on board of the space station, so we are very proud of that. We have in the small laboratory 10 positions, 10 uh, uh, positions of payload tracks, which are uh, used very frequently. Um, here we come uh, into the, the node where we had uh, at that time our exercise equipment and giving out to the airlock. In the meantime, we have also a third module uh, with uh, the node tree where now all the housing and, and exercise equipment is, uh, is placed. Here we come into the FGB. The FGB has been there since 98. It was, it was launched, so more than 15 years ago. Uh, and we will hopefully try to keep the space station alive till 2028. So that means that uh, the, the main module will have been 30 years in space, working 24-7. So that's quite an achievement if we, if we can make that happen. You know that the Americans have already extended the space station till 2024. Our Russian colleagues uh, have indicated that they would like to do the same. And uh, we will work towards the decision of our member states in uh, 2016 also to extend the space station till 2024. This is another activity here that we are doing, Earth observation, uh, for two reasons. One is uh, psychological support of the, the astronauts. Uh, of course, if you fly over the, the planet, you can take beautiful pictures of your home, your home country, things that you like. Uh, this is, uh, gives you still a connection, even though that you're far away. Uh, it still gives you a connection with your uh, planet. On the other hand, uh, we take a lot of pictures for science. Here you see a hurricane, for example, and you see this very thin blue line. Uh, one of the things that uh, has touched me the most, and, and if I talk to my colleagues, it's, it's really what stays the most uh, with you as an astronaut, is the vulnerability of our planet. Uh, when you're looking from above to, to our planet, you see that uh, there is only a very thin layer of atmosphere that protects you, uh, that protects all of us, that gives us life on our planet in this uh, uh, immensely vast universe. So uh, it, it really makes you feel small. The second thing that you see as well, of course, is from up there that there are no borders. We only have one planet to share between all of us. Uh, borders is something that uh, we draw on a map and this is uh, in our heads, but in reality, of course, they do not exist. So it, it's really a pity if you see these days what's happening on our planet and how people uh, can, can start fighting over a couple of lines on, on a map. It makes you think a lot. Uh, here's some uh, man-made islands. Uh, here you see uh, the uh, island in Dubai, the Palm Island in Dubai, of course, and here a very beautiful island, uh, Venice, uh, with the Grand Canal. Uh, we also live and uh, work on board, well, not only work, but also live on board. So general things that we do on the ground must also be done here. So we need to cut our hair. Of course, we don't have a hairdresser. So we need to uh, have this done by our crewmates. Not everybody has a lot of confidence in their crewmates, as you can see. Uh, Nicole wanted to be part of the gang as well, so we also cut her hair. Uh, and uh, Jeff has no hair, but he also wanted to be part, uh, part of the gang, so uh, that you can see here. And, uh, uh, Bob, as usual, always ready to make some, uh, some jokes. It's very important, as Roman just uh, mentioned. Uh, he also mentioned food. Well, the same thing here. You see us here, uh, a shuttle crew that arrived. We are here with 13 people around a small table sharing all our food. So it's, uh, some have mastered this very well. Uh, some not so much, as you can see. I'm certainly not one of the, of the big masters of uh, playing with food. But uh, here you see Nicole and Tim who can do that better. Um, it's a, 
It's nice to see that uh, Roman talked about Halloween. This was Halloween on board of the space station. So you see the same things that happen uh, in Mars 500 happen also with us. Uh, it's not that indeed we were also not all particularly fond of Halloween, but it's something to bring the crew together and to celebrate. Uh, here you see Tim who demonstrates that uh, Spider-Man actually does exist. You just have to... <laughs> Uh, this was an important moment for uh, Europe. It was the moment that uh, I took command of the, the space station. It was the first time that there was a non-Russian, uh, non-American uh, that was the commander of the space station. Of course, this had little to do with myself, but everything to do with uh, the people that work for ESA. In the meantime, we had done our own basic training. We had our own control center. We had our own vehicle ATV. Uh, we had uh, our own operations people, so this of course made that we uh, had a lot of experience in all these human spaceflight domains, and uh, this is also why then we were granted the position as commander on board of the space station and uh, as, uh, as ESA, as European Space Agency. Uh, and we hope of course that there will be many more European commanders uh, to come. We had now the, the class of the young astronauts, that now are all flying, uh, Luca, Samantha, Alex, Tim, uh, Andy, uh, and, uh, and Thomas. And of course, after their first flight, we hope that we then also can present them to become commanders of the space station. Certainly one of my goals. Uh, here you see uh, the uh, facility that is uh, out there at the time that I was flying. Uh, a great uh, facility, you can understand uh, the day that you leave. Uh, if you need to leave this behind, then you probably won't come back, that it's uh, a little bit uh, difficult to leave that. On the other hand, of course, the real life is here on the ground. Your family, uh, your kids, your wife, they are here, so you're also very happy to finally come back to them and to hold them in your arms again. So, uh, Heinz, you can stop the, pic the video here. Here, a last picture of uh, the crew with which I spent 187 days on board of the space station. Uh, on the top left, you see Roman Romanenko. Uh, his father was also a cosmonaut, so it's a second generation uh, cosmonaut. And I always think that Roman was born in space. He was so proficient, he could do everything from the first time. He was such a great uh, crewmate and such a great flyer. And he, in the meantime, already did a second flight. Uh, on the right, you see Bob Turk, my Canadian hero, who has helped me throughout the mission. Uh, in a fabulous way, most of the pictures that you have seen or, or videos were taken by him and uh, he's still one of, uh, uh, one of my best friends uh, now in Canada and on the bottom myself, who was very pleased to be here with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Frank. Uh, we have 10 minutes for our questions to Frank, if you would like. Just flag down uh, Sebastian, if you can get Vim on the left. Uh, hi, Frank. Uh, I'm Belgian too, but I'll do it in English so that everybody understands. Um, uh, I was glad to hear that you're, you're starting to work together with the Chinese and also I heard about the extension of the ISS. And I remember hearing about the Chinese space station that they actually have to bring it down or stop using it because one of the doors was only designed to work like seven times or something. Uh, is there parts on the ISS that are also... Uh, a final lifespan where it should stop working? Yeah, uh, for the Chinese, they don't have a space station yet. They have one module uh, right up there now, and indeed it's uh, the end of lifetime of that module. They will launch a second one, I think, uh, end this year or end next year. I think it's end next year they will launch the second one and use it for further testing, and then they will start to build their own space station in 2018, which will be a full space station at that, at that stage. Uh, for the ISS, of course, we have uh, uh, limited lifetime items as uh, for everything. Uh, so, for example, also certain hooks on the space station, they can only be used so many times on certain ports. Uh, this is why, for example, we use clamps. We don't always use the hooks, we use special clamps. Uh, on board of the space station that can take all the stress. Uh, and, and so, so today, today we, we have, have done, done all the analyses, more or less, not 100%, but 99.9%. .9%. And uh, with this analysis, it shows that we can continue to operate the space station till, till 2028. 20 
So that's the technical work that has been done so far. Uh, of course, the decision is not a technical decision. The decision will be a political decision in terms of uh, funding and in terms of the partnership wanting to continue to work on the space station together. Next question. So you talked a lot about your mission, but uh, can you just brief briefly talk about what you're doing now as a uh, manager of this facility? Thanks. Uh, yes, so today I'm uh, the head of the European Astronaut Center here. Uh, as you know, the functions here in the center are threefold. First of all, the astronauts, so we manage the astronaut core and we try to have good flights for our European astronauts. This is an important part of our human space flight program, of course, is flying people to space, uh, but not just flying them, making sure that they can get good flights with good tasks like EVAs, like robotics, and so on. Uh, this is the first part. The second part is training. Of course, if you want to get good tasks for your astronaut, they need to be very well trained and they need to be the best. Uh, and this is what our training department is, uh, is doing here. Uh, and then, also, of course, also when you want to do this, your astronauts need to be healthy uh, before the flight, but also you need to maintain their health during the flight and in the recovery pe period. And this is what uh, the, our uh, management or our medical uh, office is doing here in, in, in the house. Uh, so these are the, the three important parts for which I'm uh, responsible. Uh, of course, I have a lot of people that support me in those tasks. Uh, they, they are the experts, uh, not myself. So I try just to help them as much as I can with uh, the programmatic and the funding issues that we have. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, of course, we also need to think about the future. So within our human space flight and operations directorate, I work with our director, with the rest of the members of the team, with the member states to prepare the future. What is preparing the future? Well, I've said, first of all, we need to get an extension of the ISS till 2024. So we need to motivate our member states. We need to bring forward arguments why it's interesting and why we should continue uh, with the ISS till 2024. Uh, second is uh, to see what shall we do beyond ISS and we are developing a European space strategy, exploration strategy, which has three components, ISS, low earth orbit, the moon, and we start working together with our Russian colleagues on a robotic moon program, uh, and then Mars eventually. Mars today is only robotics. That is clear within our ESA framework. This is ExoMars. We have two missions going to Mars in the near future. Uh, but for human spaceflight, really, we start also thinking about bringing humans back to the moon. And of course, uh, it is not my task, but one of my goals that, uh, of course, if humans go back to the moon, that there will also be a European walking on the moon and not just from the, the bigger countries. Uh, and so some of the work, for example, what uh, Loredana is doing in the CAVES program is really looking into these exploration activities when we will explore on uh, bodies that uh, the moon or Mars in the, in the, in the far future. Uh, and then thirdly, as I said, is uh, the cooperation with China uh, which is also an element. Uh, ESA has a strategy to open up the, the cooperation, uh, to not just leave it to the five partners, which will be the core and are the most important ones. Don't, uh, this is certainly the case. But we think that uh, if we want to explore uh, as humanity as a whole, uh, we will need to attract also other partners. And one of the partners that we're starting to work with now is China. And so in that uh, aspect, I work a lot with our Chinese colleagues now. You said that one of the things that touches astronauts the most is the fragility of the planet. Uh, considering that in about the next decade, commercial space travel will be become available for the more rich and influential people, what kind of opportunities would there be to, to have these people, when they come back to Earth, change something in the attitude of entrepreneurship and, and politics? Yeah, in, in, in politics, it's something that we often debate with, uh, between us, uh, that we say all these world leaders that meet in all these uh, summits on, uh, uh, on climate change and whatever, maybe we should all give them a space flight before they go to these summits. Maybe they sh shall understand a little bit more what they are talking about. Uh, but uh, really, I hope that indeed with commercial space flight, uh, we can have uh, influential people uh, also flying to space and, and, and looking 
uh, towards what we can do for climate change. I, I'm an optimist uh, by nature, so I'm sure that uh, with technology we will be able to, uh, to save uh, the planet and to make a lot of changes. However, we need really decisions on, at the political level. Uh, for example, if you look to the car industry today, uh, there were regulations proposed at the European Commission to reduce a lot the maximum uh, emission rates of cars. Well, under the lobbying of the car industries, this the, the, the maximum emissions have been uh, raised again to what was initially proposed. If we would have courageous leadership in Europe, we could say, well, by 2020, no more cars that drive on fossil fuel can be sold in Europe, only electrical cars, for example, or hydrogen cars. I'm sure that we have the technology to do that. I'm sure that we have the capability to do that, but it will take leadership to come to such decisions. I'm sure that over time they will be there, and I'm sure that maybe in 50 years from now, people will say, what were they thinking using all this gas and putting all this CO2 out there uh, with uh, millions of cars uh, all over Europe. What, what were they thinking at that time? But okay, it will take some leadership and hopefully with commercial space flight, with getting some of those influential people uh, also flying to space, uh, we can change that. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really optimistic that it can be done. Unfortunately, it will not be done very soon, I think. And we'll take one final question. Or not. Uh, or not. No more. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, Wait for the microphone. What are the colors like without any atmosphere? Are they different? The colors are really not a lot different, uh, of course, because the stars, if you look to them, maybe they're a little bit more bright, but on the other hand, it's very difficult as well in the space station to get a real dark environment. Because on the outside, you still have the lights of the cameras, uh, on the inside, it's also difficult. It's only like in the Soyuz that you can make everything black and look uh, look outside. So they are a little bit more bright, they are a little bit more colorful, but it's not much different than what you see uh, from here on, on the ground. That's my personal uh, opinion, but uh, okay, maybe other astronauts have other, have other impressions because I think uh, perceiving colors and perceiving how the stars look like is something very personal, of course. All right, thank you, Frank. Um, we are going to finish up now. If I can have the organizers come on stage. Alex, Jan, Sebastian, Roman. And you need to stay on stage for a minute. We have something for you also. <laughs> All right, so firstly, you missed this yesterday, but we had uh, a very special guest who is a bit of a whiz at designing Lego, custom Lego. And uh, this is not on the market, but he has designed a miniature custom ISS, and these are the pieces for you to build your own. Thank you very much. So uh, I shall do this when I have a little bit of free time in my office, uh, <laughs> in between meetings. <laughs> or maybe during a meeting when it's a during, boring meeting. During a teleconference. During, <laughs> during one tele teleconferences, conference. absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and from us at Space Up, uh, this is an extra thing for your coffee. Thank you or very your much. tea, actually. Yeah. And, uh, and for the EAC, uh, we have this Space Up banner, which has been signed by everybody who attended. So okay. thank you very much for allowing us to use the center over the weekend. Um, yeah. we, it was a, an absolute privilege to be able to be here for this weekend. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, and uh, uh, actually the thanks needs to go, of course, to all of you, because uh, the fact that you organized this event, uh, I already got a mail from Fernando Doblas, the head of our uh, communication uh, office, uh, who said, who was watching it online, and said it's absolutely fabulous. So thanks, guys, for uh, doing this and for coming all here. Uh, since I am the boss, I can distribute action items, so I give an action item to you, Andre, to you, Roman, to find a good place for this uh, Space Up uh, banner somewhere, so that it can be displayed at least uh, in the near future here at uh, ESC. And for all of you, again, thanks again for your enthusiasm, for coming here, and uh, for keeping uh, human spaceflight high in the skies. Thank you.
All right, so now we have sadly come to the end of our Space Up Cologne event. I hope you had fun during the past two days, but before we close, first of all, I'd like to give a big, big thank you again to ESA, to DLR, to our Space Life cast guys up there, and uh, woo! And <laughs> you deserve it. And of course, uh, our keynote speakers, Reinhold Ewald was here yesterday, Frank de Winde today, and also Jürgen Hill, and we had a lot of, every, every, each and every one of you was awesome. But thank you, thank you guys for making this happen, because you're the ones who, who, who bring the spirit into this, in this kind of unconference, and it's all, it's all about you. Without you, uh, we couldn't have done it. So uh, thanks again for everything, and uh, you will be able to watch um, the recording of, this, um, the, of all the sessions that took place here in the foyer. Um, they will be on the Space Life cast a page, and also you will be able to uh, see them on the ESA web page somewhere. You will find them. Um, it will probably take a few days until everything is up, but keep checking in case you miss a session. You can we can go back and watch it again. And we would. Uh, and uh, I'd like to say a particular thanks to my colleagues from ESA EAC who came in for free for the entire weekend. Thank you very much, guys, especially for the tour yesterday and uh, your presence for throughout the entire event. So thank you. They're mostly up the back and sitting everywhere. Thank you, ESC. And, and, and a huge, huge thank you. You guys uh, probably don't see him because he's magically invisible, but uh, this is Georg, and he made uh, everything with the setup, with the chairs, with the food, and with the entire magic of this event, including uh, assisting with the security and uh, with AV and IT, and to be honest, everything, like absolutely everything. Thank you so much, Georg. So, thank you. Okay, so and if you enjoyed this event and would like to go to another space up, here's the man who will tell you when and where there are next opportunities where you can experience the awesomeness. All right, thank you very much. But before I do so, um, first of all, uh, let me uh, thank the local organizers because obviously without all these supporting people, it's not possible. But uh, everything starts with the organizing team. So guys, thank you very much for a very, very successful space up, which will be hard to beat. Don't forget to mention your... Yeah. I was stepping aside for you guys. Yeah. Now, obviously, we've had a great weekend here um, at the European Astronaut Center. Uh, and if you enjoyed this, uh, there's the opportunity to have more of this later this year. So uh, I'm actually happy to make uh, a very first announcement of a new space up uh, that is added to two space ups later this year uh, in Europe that will happen. Uh, the very first of which uh, we've advertised throughout will happen in Strasbourg at the International Space University on 11th and 12th of April. So uh, please feel invited. Uh, if you like this, if you want more of this, please join us again uh, at the International Space University uh, in uh, a few weeks, actually. Um, I'm also happy to announce that uh, today, for the first time, we have a date and a venue for the first uh, space up in Italy which is going to happen on October 24th and 25th at the La Sapienza University in Rome. So um, if you happen to be in Italy at the end of October, please join us again at Space Up in Rome. And then last but certainly not least, something that's been in the pipeline for quite a while, and uh, members of the organizing team are actually here, so thank you very much, is uh, a Space Up France that will happen in Paris at the Polytechnique, just south of Paris, uh, on 7 and 8 of November. So uh, please, again, if you're in France, uh, join us there. Um, obviously, it doesn't need to end with these three space ups that have already been organized. Uh, there's another one uh, in the pipeline that we don't have that much information on yet, but that will happen in the Netherlands also this year. The organizers uh, are here, and um, you will find information on that one later. But there's always the opportunity, and actually, space up is a community-driven um, series of events if you think you have a great venue, you have a great date, you, you can gather a group of people like this, which is really not that difficult, um, please uh, see if you can organize a space up in your city. There's plenty of places in Europe. We have 380 million people living in Europe. There's uh, many corners in Europe where we haven't had space up. So please 
feel free to organize your own space up. Go to the SpaceUp website, um, spaceup.org, uh, to find lots of information on how to do that. And really, it's not as difficult as you think. Uh, only once you start organizing, you find out that it's much more difficult than you may think. Uh, <laughs> Just, just ask these people. But uh, this is a community-driven event, so please continue the spirit. And um, I hope to see you at a Space Up event somewhere in Europe in the future. Thank you very much. All right, so before we go to our final group photo, which we're going to do in front of the Columbus mock-up in the astronaut training hall that you saw yesterday, uh, just three final things. So uh, firstly, if you would like, there are some extra goodies uh, just on the side of the stairs and the space station module. You're allowed to take uh, as many things as you like. There's also some posters for Yuri's Night if you live uh, near the Cologne area in Germany. Um, and some other ESA posters and goodies. If you are traveling far and you want to protect the mug that you got, we have some empty boxes that you can put the mug in so that it won't get damaged in your luggage during travel. Okay. Oh, no, the badges. Oh, badges, yes. Um, the reception will kill me on Monday. Uh, please, please, your plastic on your badges, I need it back. You can keep the paper as a souvenir, but I must have the plastic back. Please give it to reception or put it on the table at reception before you go. Please, please, please do not take the plastic out of that door. And uh, finally, before we go to the group photo, so please uh, join us straight through to the training hall. We'll follow Frank also because he has the access badge to get into the training hall. Mine doesn't go that high. Um, we, yeah, uh, as you are quite excited, we saw a lot about LEGO this weekend, and you saw that we were giving a special presents to our speakers of the mini ISS LEGO. And you are a little bit jealous, I realize. So we saved the best for last. Um, we actually have been uh, on the phone with Denmark quite a lot, mostly Chris, uh, our LEGO master builder. Um, not technically a master builder, but we like to call him this anyway. Uh, LEGO did not have enough bricks. We tried. Uh, but they will have enough soon. They're making more, especially for us. So we will be sending you an email in the next week. Please reply to us with your home address, and we will send you your very own uh, International Space Station custom LEGO. All right. All right, let's go to the photo. And thank you for watching on Space Lifecast. <laughs>